Oki te mihi nui, no mai, no mai, hari mai. Welcome along to um, the resumption of our hearings on our long-term plan. Uh, we'll start this morning with uh, 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 a mihi from uh, Yale. Thank you for that. I'd like uh, to start our first submission of the day is Drusilla uh, uh, Kingy Patterson, and Drusilla is um, a friend of the council. She's been around for a long time and made a number of submissions. So, Drusilla, if you'd like to come forward. Just before we start, oh, we've got a councillor online. Uh, councillor Mackay, can you hear us? Yes, Peter, I can. Thank you. Now, Drusilla, we've got we've allowed 10 minutes speaking time and... Yeah, I'm just waiting. We've allowed 10 minutes speaking time, uh, Drusilla, and Louise has got a bell. She'll ring it at nine nine minutes and that uh, gives you an idea when to come in for a landing and then there'll be some questions so thank you push a button please can i stand or do i have to stop um kia ora. uh this journey for me my co-papa started um i won't tell you how young i was but um the 1974 commonwealth games and if you take a step back and you look at Canterbury, if we were to get a big major event, probably 2.30, how do we how do we benefit from it? So that's actually been my co-papa and that's why I've been kind of lobbying on everything. I look, I actually do submissions over five councils because I look at it as a super, super city. If you're in Auckland, you'd only deal with one body, but because we're all kind of fragmented, we've had to do that, okay? We are actually 218 
probably 208 is with regards to film in Canterbury. With the earthquake, we lost 20%. Um, it put us 20, back 20 years. I've spent 14 years collecting wardrobe stuff. I didn't want to really go down that road, but I've got enough stuff to start a full company at the Templeton site when they're ready. Okay, I've got two film projects. I've got another one. Both those I've been working on for eight years. To put them on in a, in a hall costs 30000 so we're now going to use dolls' houses. So I'm looking at how our young people get from A to B. A lot of them don't have money. They're on student benefits, stuff like that. They might have to travel from Waimakariri all the way to Lincoln. And then also what I've been following is agriculture, the hemp industry. I'll give you an example. There was three young guys won a scholarship for the Huanui, I think for 64000 and they are going to produce hemp seeds and hemp stuff. What you don't know is there's a company in, in, um, in Burnside, the yarn factory, which used to make carpet. They have a machine, is the only one in the hemisphere, that can actually turn um, the stem into um, fibre. And I see this actually as we're talking um, as a growth industry. The thing I'm looking at is if you're unemployed and also health, if you're living in Ashburton and the hospital doesn't cater for what you need, how do you travel? And what happens is people are forced to move. So the long-term vision for me is we need fast rail from the back of the bus going right up on the Lincoln run and you would actually pick up and if we're going to go zero carbon, we've got to look at that. And then we've also got to look at if once the uh, stadium is built, how do we move people? How do they get from A to B? Otherwise, we're going to miss the boat. Now, and the big concern for me, which has just happened, as I put in my notes with regards to the $45 million film studio, I saw that on TV and my pants around the saying, oh, I've got wardrobe and I've got this. If you're, most of the finance for film comes from America, if you're an American company and we've still got COVID and you're looking at, I want to bring a film company, do I take them to Auckland or do I take them to Wellington where they've got wardrobe or do I take them to Templeton where I'll have wardrobe? They will make that decision. But what's actually happened is some big players, American backing, are backing an Auckland company and they're going to go all the way to Wanaka and they're building a big film studio over there. And they're also going to build a park the size of Central Park in London. Probably, I don't know who it is, but it still will be good for the South Island. So I just want you to bear that in mind. That's where I come from. On film, which I was doing, I did animal players, operatic, and I'm moving into script writing. After my two projects, I want to work on a terrace film, which will start in Christchurch and go right down the South Island and end up in Fox Glacier. I've just decided to, to do that for the 1996 Rover MG, which I've got to do up for that. And um, so now that's all. And, and there's no funding. There's no funding anywhere, OK? Thank you, Drusilla, uh, for that insight into what you're up to. Ed, now, We've got time for questions. Is, are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Farm. Yeah, thanks so much for your submission, Drusilla. Um, so out of all of the scope of Environment Canterbury work, you've mentioned rail is like a really key opportunity. Would you say that was a priority for you in terms of our business? Well, it's not growth rate for young ones. Okay. I've got two boys. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, a good example, I've got one son that wouldn't get his license, he's 28, he's gone to Wellington because he can catch on rail. You know, and that's, but you've got to look at, and what happens in, over in Wanakaruri, a lot of the kids have to leave because the buses, you know, they, they might have a, doing a degree at Lincoln, and it's, it's better for them to live in town. But you've got to look at if the tourist market's open, and also too, it means if you have rail, you can have prisoners going up to White, White, um, what's it, Weka Pass, K 
Cape Valley. If the guys that live in um, Christchurch have to get to Cape Valley, they start at six. We should be doing that, and that because once you once you find all this housing and development goes, you've got to have a long term vision. That's virtually what I'm saying. You've got to have a long term vision that you're going to move into rail. Because I've been hearing the same stuff for the last twenty years, and nothing's happened. And the other thing is too, just one more thing. The next growth industry will actually be health products, um, berries, and that. So we're talking agriculture. All right. Do any other questions from councillors? Thank you, Drusilla. Yeah, um, just a matter of process that I should have said at the start here. Um, they, they stacked a few people up at the start, so um, we hope to be able to catch up. And the reason that we've done that, I think we've got four before 9.15, is that sometimes we have people pull out and it gives us a continuity. So we'll get through this and we'll catch up as soon as we can. So I'd like to call uh, Pabudu uh, to... Uh, Give his submission. Ata Maria and Kiora, ko pumuso sa nai kato I just want to give you a little introduction to myself before I begin. So I'm a husband, a brother, a son, a citizen of Otatahi and Aotearoa. Uh, I'm a ratepayer. I'm also a voter, just so you know. Uh, my formal training is as a physicist, and I was part of a small team of volunteers that wrote the policy and science framework for New Zealand Zero Carbon Act uh, and worked for many, many hours for about four years uh, to get that passed into law. So my submission, obviously, there's a written version, but uh, this one will be in three parts. Um, I want to address the priorities as set out in the long-term plan, uh, the specifics of the necessary funding and the funding uh, raising of revenue, and what I think are some gaps in the plan. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the staff that would have spent countless hours putting all the materials for the consultation together, you know, doing all the work to get the projections, assessments, and organizing the sessions, um, getting in contact with submitters like myself. Um, I understand what a major undertaking that is. And I just want to uh, say your dedication to enabling such an informed process is a really important demonstration of the professional ethics of public service, and I really appreciate that. So, and any criticism we have directed towards the, the concepts, not any, any of the staff, I think they've done a fantastic job. Uh, in terms of priorities in the long-term plan, in general, I agree with the activities of the six key areas presented here. Uh, although looking through the budgeting details, um, it struck me, for example, that the regional and strategic leadership budget is almost $10 million greater than the climate change and community resilience budget. Um, I assume there, there's some prioritization in, in the way the budgets are set up. And I think this indicates how poorly understood the challenges and consequences of climate change are. Not just at this regional council, but it's, it's a general problem, right? And as a physicist, it kind of pains me to, to see people kind of petting blindly to this problem. Um, and digging into the details of this, for example, in the climate change resilience, resilience work stream, uh, there's an indication that the actual implementation plans are both lacking, which is understandable but, but disappointing, uh, but also that the implementation stuff is on the horizon of a four to ten year um, window. This work stream needs to be accelerated, right? We're already at about 1.2 degrees warming, so adaptation is going to have to happen, and it's going to have to happen soon. Um, I, as an example, I, I know that the budget item, uh, but the budget stream for the governance services stream is, is about five times more than the, the kind of climate change resilience team. And to be fair, in the long-term plan details, of the, there's, there's not much details of what the governance services actually are. But anyway, um, that's just an example of, of what I think the priorities are a bit messed up. Uh, specifics on the necessary funds. So as a rate payer, I believe that um, there should be great investment, uh, but also reduction in the amount of use space um, um, incentives in key areas. So what I mean by such as public transport. So what I mean by that is, you should have to pay less, but there should be overall um, greater investment. I think the biggest barriers to uptake um, in, in public transport, for example, in Christchurch and around Canterbury, is just poor planning and implementation of services. And that's not to say that a particular service won't run for time, but for example, geographically, they're not very well planned, particularly on the city. Um, as a rate payer, I support uh, further increases in rates in order to improve these services. Um, and I also think that rates should be far more progressive uh, in, in terms of, of property ownership. I think the bare minimum in the proposals is option one. I think we, should, we have to um, try and hit that at least. 
Uh, and in addition, the rates should be pro uh, should be progressive and increase growth with the value of property, which they do already. But also maybe think about whether they should also have some uh, increase depending on how many properties one owns. Um, I think that option one is generally affordable to the community, but we should reduce things like uniform annual general charges to zero. I think these are essentially flat taxes, and such taxes are demonstrably inequitable and hit the lowest income citizens the hardest. All targeted rates uh, should also be made progressive. So under these proposals, I personally would pay more rates, for example, but I think equitable generation of revenue in order to provide for, public, uh, for the public is a must. And when we do these kinds of things, we must do it so that the least burden of, of these costs uh, fall on the most vulnerable members of our community. Um, in terms of the gaps in the plan, so I've already addressed what I think are some prioritization issues, but there are some specific gaps that I want to talk about. The largest here is around uh, water quality, uh, especially when it comes to things like nitrates and water. Uh, for at least a decade, the Regional Council, I think, has utterly failed in this duty of care and has advocated its responsibility to the public when it comes to maintaining the health and quality of our regional waterways, water supplies, and the general use permits of water. Uh, this has partly been because of the well-documented hijacking of democracy that happened about a decade ago, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but it's also because there's an inability in general for people to act on the science. I think the current um, long-term plan highlights this. It fails to recognize the increasing levels of nitrates in our water systems, but also fails to recognize the emerging science indicating that the current recommendations of safe levels are probably a large overestimate. Uh, the levels should be much lower, I think. And I also note that the words nitrate don't seem to appear anywhere in the detailed cons uh, consultation materials, which is bizarre to me. Uh, you know, it should be at least in one of the targets in one of the, one of the work streams, but it's not. It's a major problem facing the region, and it's just not there. Um, because of, maybe I missed it, but I don't think so. I did a Google so actual search, right? Uh, because um, because these are problems that have multi-year spans, the failure act now will only be obvious way down the track, by which time it will already be too late. We're already, already about a decade behind. Um, it's important that the council can both digest and act on emerging and established science as quickly as possible. COVID, in the COVID-19 world, we have a clear, undeniable observation of what happens when emerging scientific advice is ignored, right? We also know what happens when advice is heated. New Zealand and other countries overseas are, 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 um, are a demonstration of this. COVID-19 is an acute phenomenon, clearly demonstrating the perils of inaction, but things like nitrates are chronic and take much longer for, for this to happen. We're already a decade behind, and the LTP doesn't do enough to address this. And I think once again, the council will be failing in its responsibility if it doesn't. Uh, similar criticism can be leveled at the provision of public transport. I understand that it's really ridiculous with the sharing of responsibility between regional council and local council, and there's, there's these barriers, but you know, this has been going for a long time, so we need to sort this out. Um, public transport needs to be both prioritized in its development and understood as a key lever in Canterbury's climate mitigation response. And as such, the current system of pricing and the quality of service where you can measure quality along the dimensions of timeliness, frequency, geographical accessibility, and availability throughout the day. Um, I think the poor quality of that are key reasons for poor uptake of public transport. Uh, the proposals don't do enough to address this, I don't think. Uh, in fact, when you look at the consultation document, it says one of the purposes is, and I'm quoting here, deliver quality, cost-effective public transport services that meet the needs of the community and results in increased patronage. But in none of the performance tables, there, are, are there any any actual measurements of patronage uh, itself? Now, there's an excuse in there saying that because of um, COVID-19 that we can't have these targets. So I might understand that the council believes that the COVID restrictions will last a decade. How does that make sense? Um, in, the, in addition to that, we had data prior to COVID. We'll have data post-COVID. It doesn't make any sense to say, oh, no, we can't calculate for a year, therefore we can't do targets. Um, as, as a, as a, as a, as a numerate, numerate person, that's nonsense. Um, in addition, public transport, public transport, like the previous submitter said, um, should be con considered beyond buses. Specifically, regional rail transportation should be considered explicitly in the long-term plan. Um, I think that's a valid case for regional rail for commuters, and I think that will have a large number of benefits for the region. And I think developing and actually in these proposals uh, should be part of the long-term plan. Um, so in closing, I just want to make a final observation, and this might be slightly philosophical, so bear with me. Uh, the failure to act on things like the water issues and the lack of the provision of public transport, I think, are uh, uh, both are symptoms of a deeper problem here. Yeah. And it comes from the deepest understanding of the nature of society and our systems, I think. So action on water issues are often diametrically balanced against economic impact, uh, and the public services are diametrically balanced against the, on the cost of books, right, rather than looking at the total costs of inaction. This leaves nothing but tinkering around the edges. 
this thinking fails to recognize that prioritizing the health and well-being of your community of our community actually in turn leads to a healthy economy, not the other way around. Again, the differences in global responses to COVID-19 has directly demonstrated this. Uh, there's, there's no excuse to not see the observed patterns anymore. Yet, even with the pandemic staring us in our faces, we refuse to acknowledge this demonstrable reality. So I implore you to remove your blinders and act accordingly. Thanks. And thank you, Pumidu. Um Questions? We've got time for a couple. Lan. Yeah, thanks so much for your submission. And I wanted to um, touch on something that you didn't get time to talk about this morning, but you mentioned borrowing, the borrowing aspect in your submission. Um, and you talked about it being interchangeable rates. So do you mean you would like offsetting? Thank you. Um, do you mean you would like to see the rate increases that we've proposed and then additional scope for borrowing for those areas that you mentioned? Yes, I, I think borrowing should be targeted uh, for specific projects. Uh, and um, yes, it should be on top of the race that I proposed. So. Thank you very much. I was interested in um, your, your, ref, your references to um, when a person owns a number of properties, um, that the valuations of them in total should be rated accordingly. I just wondered, like, um, clearly some properties are pretty large in Canterbury. Um, some farms are worth many millions of dollars. So I'm just wondering how you might address that that aspect. That in fact, this would be a big change. Yeah, it's absolutely. It would be quite a massive change. So obviously, the, the progressiveness of the capital value should remain. I'm not saying it's one or the other, uh, but I think uh, you, you can set the leverage such that. Uh, the total value is, is accounted for in one aspect, and the number of properties are accounted for in another aspect. So, so for example, in, in, in my way of thinking, uh, if you had two properties in town, perhaps the second one has a slightly higher abatement rate, uh, or slightly lower abatement rate, of course, uh, and uh, whereas the, the large property will still end up paying more rates depending on the value of the property. That's that's not a, I don't think those are that, but both opposed. That part will be, that part will be still on a progressive sort of scale. Yes. Thank you for explaining. Okay, thank you. I think we'll uh, we'll we'll call it to a close there. We thank you. You fit a lot into that uh, time slot and gave us a lot to think about. So thank you for that, and thank you for your thoughts that you put into this. The next two uh, submitters, just so that they are aware, is the next one is David Hotter and then followed by, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Shaw. David. <coughs> Yeah, I'm a local city resident, Miss Braden, but I spent a lot of my recreational time out of the city. And uh, I've come to the conclusion after many years and involvement with a couple of departments that we've got a bit of a, well, we've got a few problems with our, our governance between central government and, and the regions. And um, I'd like this, this morning to implore you to uh, take a, a somebody to start looking at public access because this is one of my, my pet hobbies there's lots of places in the back country we cannot get to for a number of reasons and most of it's historical and legal and i get very much involved with making submissions on tenure review of the high country and it, there's a lot of issues in that area too which uh, the government at the moment is, is considering and we're waiting for a paper to come out next month which might give us some guidance as to how they're going to handle some of this in the future. A couple of examples, I, from my experience as an engineer with the NDD, in the order of back country, uh, and dealing with local bodies with water rights, with hydro schemes and things. And I've come to the conclusion that we've got uh, a lack of coordination between central government and you people as local government on some issues, and this is one of them and that's public access to the backcountry. And one of the other ones that uh, local bodies get involved with or get a responsibility for is paper roads. And uh, other government departments have got other issues, um, like Department of Conservation, and you even get fish and game into the issue. And you've got land, the Commissioner of Crown Lands, who's very much involved with running 
the tenure review program, which is a current topic. But nowhere do we find anybody who's got a responsibility for public access. No, no government department's got that, that role. And as a regional council, you're in a good position to look at both sides of it. You've sort of got to handle the, the situation, the legal side of it from central government, and you've got no money either, no proper resource of money like the government has. And the one the conservation is a problem too, we're trying to manage national parks. And uh, looking to the future, I agree with your proposal for funding because things are moving very quickly and we don't know quite how speed's going to go in the next few years with our problems with uh, climate change. And so somebody has to take an overall view and come up with a solution to how they resolve the problems we have between local bodies. And in my experience, the local bodies are pretty well controlled out in the region by the local farmers, and they control the access. But the city guy, like myself, wants to go out there. Um, there's nobody to go to to negotiate. We've got a, an organisation, sort of semi-government, called New Zealand Access Commission. And they've just had their 10-year review on their life. And uh, it's a knock on my nice said, said during this report. But who's going to make a decision on what to do about the problems that these reviews have brought up? And this is what I'm bringing up. The problem is that we've got nobody responsible overall for public access to the back country. We've got what's there now, but we don't seem to have a mechanism anywhere at the moment to resolve issues that we're getting. And it's going to come up soon, possibly attain Molesworth, for example, which is now conservation land. We'd like to get access. What's, who's going to look after the public access conditions that are allowed in there? The, the committee that's helping run uh, Molesworth, sort of on behalf of conservation, and with, with a major tenant in the form of a, a sort of um, government cattle farm. Um, but there's no guidance as to how to handle these situations and I'm asking you to get somebody to start looking at it. It's very much a legal matter in some of the areas and that's why guys like myself can't do any much about it because you want to take a legal argument but have a lot of money behind you and we're just quietly increasing the problem between the haves and the have-nots in New Zealand and we've got to start looking at it and try to resolve it. We've got a lot of other problems all around our, around our heads with climate change um, and we've got a COVID-19 problem in the world. So it's difficult to focus on some of these things that are very historical and traditional, which are not solved by our current legislative arrangements in New Zealand. That's what I'm asking today. Thank you for that, <clears throat> David. There is a real challenge there. Uh, Councillor Edge. Thanks, David. Thanks very much. Just wanted to clarify, you, you're basically... Um, um, wanting to see a uh, more regionally, perhaps strategic approach to recreational, uh, or looking at recreational opportunities and, and, a, and a coordination and role with perhaps other agencies. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Well, that, that's part of it. But for the situation, for example, Predator Free New Zealand 2050, it, it's a dream, and, and I'm part of it. I do my little bit. At Lewis Pass every month, but it's not coordinated with all the other factors that we have in the country and what's happening around the world. And uh, I, for example, if we want to do predator control at Lake, Lake Sumner, there's no public access to Lake Sumner. I can't take my car to Lake Sumner. And they have a forest park up there, but you do not, you cannot drive to Lake Sumner. It's, it's an outcome of all some of these things that I've mentioned. Tenure review, there's been no public input on public access in the tenure review. It's supposed to be there legislatively, but the government departments involved have got no responsibility for public access. So the farmers and their lawyers negotiate with the uh, Commissioner of Crown Lands and the decision is made. The public's not in the room. So, you know, we've got problems with our infrastructure and how it's run. And we've got to look at that and see if we can't solve it. Thank you, David. I will take a question from Councillor McKenzie. But, but David, just to make it clear, you're asking for vehicle access rather than just public access. 
I forgot. <laughs> Unless you've got vehicle access, how are you going to get the public to go out there and control the predators by no boot? The only way I can get there is by helicopter. And anybody around the room paid person for a helicopter? Thank you, uh, Councillor um, Megan Hans. Thanks for your submission. Hey, I'm just just reading through it here, David, and just had a question around your your reference for recharge for managing freshwater quality. Just to be clear, in the long term plan, there's a piece about Ashburton or the Heinz manager for recharge. Would you like to see us invest in aquifer recharge elsewhere in the region? Yeah, we we got a little problem there too because central government saying one thing and we in the region saying another. Um, I'm inclined to go with the the user who pays as a say, um, and hopefully they're looking to the future as well. And I, what you've done in the past with the, with the irrigation groups, I reckon it's, good, it's great. We just have got this little problem with national government, or, sorry, the government, um, and. Uh, I'm not too sure what uh, the Labour government has planned for us in the future because after the election, we ha I haven't heard a lot of some of the questions I've had discussion with some of them in, uh, in public meeting. And I, I don't know just what's going to happen, but I, I, I support the public in the local public input who've got a, a knowledge of what they're talking about and looking to the future and trying to protect the future. So I, I'm waiting as well. Thank you, David. I think we'll call this to a, a conclusion. So thank you for that. And I think the point that you brought up about public act, access will certainly come up in our deliberations. So thank you for your submission. Can I call Richard uh, Shaw, please? And then followed by um, Ian McClellan after Richard. Well, Richard. I just note, Richard, that you've um, this is your submission, but it's supported by I think there's at least 29 to 30 names that you've supplied to us also, so we take that into account. Okay, thank you. I just want to confirm, because I had requested whether I could have longer than 10 minutes to cover the views of some of the others as well. I'd love to give you more, longer than 10 minutes, but we're not going to. We're going to keep to 10 minutes, but uh, this time slot's sort of like 10 to 15 minutes so that we've got time for questions. So your submission is for 10 minutes, and then we have some time for questions. Okay, well, it contradicts what I was informed by email when I made the... Uh, Inquiry, so I'll uh, try and keep it concise then. The first point that um, I wanted to make was really around communications. Um, I wanted to make the submission based not only on myself, but uh, on behalf of others in our community. A number of people don't feel comfortable speaking in public. Some who find it a challenge to actually navigate the systems provided for submissions. Um, and some who don't have, actually have access to, um, to internet systems or are somewhat oblivious to the process that's going on and the way in which it's going to impact them. So as you alluded to, yeah, I'm, I've been asked to speak on behalf of four people who've made submissions and 26 people who didn't make submissions but um, have expressed their support for so the concerns that um, they've raised. You can notify on the web page that the long-term plan will be available for review in late February. On the 3rd of March, I sent an email to can asking when it was going to be uh, issued because it hadn't yet been issued. I got acknowledgement of my email, but I didn't get any response. So it's issued on the 8th of March that effectively provided three days to review the full document and then to be in a position to make any freedom of information requests to get more detailed information to support the submission, the submissions proposing on April 11th. So I think there's a bit of a problem there in communications in terms of being able to know when the plan is going to be issued, then have sufficient time to review it, and then be certain of getting responses if clarifications are required. There's a lot of information to go through and there's a lot of questions that are raised that um, are not easily answered. So they've had some other issues with ECAN in terms of uh, getting responses where emails are sent through, they are acknowledged, but we don't get replies to them. Um, I mean, we've had discussions back and forth uh, about some of the questions which I've raised and the ability to answer those easily or not, whether there are legal ramifications around that. Um, so there are some challenges around the communications aspects of this. I have had some support from some councillors who've uh, spent the evenings and weekends, I think, answering some of my in-length uh, in questions, and I'd like to thank them for that. Um, but I do find the process has been difficult. Um, 
the examples that have been provided by ECAN are not really representative. You know, the booklet that was provided, the summary of the long-term plan, is a bit more of a sales brochure, um, highlighting the or emphasising the highlights and uh, sort of steering well away from some of the more contentious issues. You know, you provide the rates tool, which does enable people to go and look at their specific, the impact on their specific costs. Um, it doesn't provide uh, information about the breadth and the, uh, the inequality of proposed rate increases. Then you have a look at the affordability and the equity, um, equitable charging. Um, I think it's just uh, really disappointing that such an unaffordable and biased funding approach has been put forward. What's devastating sad to me about that is that many of the really important projects and work that ECAN are proposing is lost because the discussion has now come around the unaffordability and the discriminatory approaches towards funding that have been put out there and that the rural community is bearing the brunt of that. The way in which it has been communicated suggests that we have an average of 24% increase. We have to ask the question though, is 24% realistic? And when we've got pensioners who are going to get a 3% increase in their pensions this year, we have families who are on fixed budgets and we're asking an 18 or a 24.5% increase. The answer from most of them that I spoke to in our community is neither are, are affordable to them. And the CPI has been running at 2% since 2011. Challenges we and looking at here is ECAN has a stated position of keeping rates below 5.3% rises. And yet when we've done some probing of your model, it looks that some people will be faced with increases of over 150%. I mean, I'd ask how many people knew when this went out that is, was the disparity going to be so large that some, those within the Christchurch, Greater Christchurch area, would be paying less than 10%, and some, those in rural areas we're paying over 150 percent. I'd really like to know whether people feel that that is a fair and equitable spread. I think the question is now how can people plan for their future and their finances if government bodies can't manage to keep their costs under control? If now who's someone whose in income is going to increase by 3% a year managed to cover rate increases that are greater than tenfold less, and for some 50 times greater than this. There doesn't appear to have been any attempt by ECAN to cut costs anywhere. Can't find it anywhere in any of the documentation. Everything that ECAN has planned for or intends to do, whether it's legislated or not, is being included. And unfortunately, I don't consider that it is sustainable or affordable for the community. Some of the funding discussions being put forward have talked around um, putting it on values of properties. And a lot of that so has come off the rural communities. It appears to be targeted towards farmers, but it's caught up all rural dollars in it. And the biggest percentage increases are on non-farming rural property holders. And, you know, farmers are aggrieved because they've been caught up with uh, full cost recovery. I mean, historically, we justify or ECAN has justified rate increases, high rate increases on rural properties to achieve the cost of resource concerns. Then they introduce full cost recovery. So cost recovery is now an extra charge that put on farmers. And now the rates on those cost recoveries are going up further. It started to look like a cash cow exercise rather than just cost recovery. In the uh, revenue and finance policy that's been put out by ECAN, it said that capital value is considered a more equitable basis for an tax principle, and that council considers higher capital value properties will generally be better able to bear the cost of a proportionally higher general rate. But the fact is we're seeing discrepancies in that, major discrepancies. The highest percentage increases are going to the smaller value rural properties. We're now in a situation where a $580,000 Christchurch property is going to be paying less ECAN rates than a $380,000 
calcium hypochlorite. That doesn't appear fair and equitable to me. The thing we need to look at is what is the cost cutting that can be done? And the requirement is going to be to eliminate non-essential activities and cut back budgets. We need to stop putting in place policies and charges that discriminate between our three communities. It should be a single community. It's the only way we're going to move forward to achieve the goals that we really need to achieve, especially around climate change. It's my perspective, and that with many of the people in our community, that the current proposed long-term plan is so fundamentally flawed that it's not fit for deliberation, and a complete review of the funding approach is required. It's tragic that the cost and waste associated with proposing such an unequal, biased, and potentially discriminatory funding approach has been put forward, and that the pushback is so strong from the community. I don't think I can actually convey to you how angry some people are, although maybe they've spoken to and you've gauged that already. There is quite a degree of damage that's been caused with ECAN's relationship with rural communities through this unequal funding proposal. It exacerbates the urban-rural divide that's already there and which could do with healing rather than further division. It can also struggle with their credibility in rural communities because of some of the historic approaches that they've taken. And this current funding is just driving that wedge further. It's really difficult for ECAN and ECAN's employees who have to interface with rural communities to maintain credibility and to build trust and relationships with many rural rural um, dwellers. I think some considerations that I'd like you to think about. You know, ECAN does not have a priority claim upon people's in incomes. Our local government rates are also proposed to increase at almost three times inflation. It's not the only thing. The work you're doing is important, but so is lots of the other work that other bodies are doing important. When we start to add all those together, the compound interest rates and the increases in charges from all government bodies, it's becoming very significant on people's disposable incomes and just on those on fixed budgets. I think the comment is that those people who can least afford it in our communities are the ones that are actually going to end up being hit hardest by this. And we also need to take into account the impacts that COVID have had, that drought is having. I think what's one thing that's obvious from my uh, comments to you there is we didn't get to any of the specifics in the long-term plan. And that is the big problem, is that what you have put forward has been met with such strong resistance in the rural communities that we're not even discussing the issues that we want to address. Thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, and I'll ask for questions, Elizabeth McGinty. Um, thanks, Richard. I've just got a question um, around um, well, affordability. Um, so, in fact, the rural um, non-farming say, I don't know, the towns in the country that you're talking about, low value rural um, properties and the um, city ones actually do pay about the same. But as you've noticed that the amount is slightly high enough, um, we've actually increased the UAGC. Um, and I noticed that you put in your submission that you, you don't support what we've done with the um, uniform and your general charge. Um, so, would you support reducing that in order to reduce the uh, rates on those lower value properties? I think my response actually commented that I thought it was a very difficult area because if you look at the different people in our community, if you are a large landowner, then you are likely to support a higher uniform annual general charge because it spreads the cost across a, a much wider tax base and everybody is contributing towards the initiatives that are being put forward. But what it also does is it potentially um, impacts those on fixed income pensioners. Um, so I actually support both, which is a very difficult response to give you, that I think there should be a uniform annual general charge that is slightly higher than we've got at the moment, which may be fairer, but there would need to be a way to find where it doesn't target those who cannot actually afford it. Any other questions of Richard? 
uh, Councillor Hens. Thank you, Richard. Uh, you referred in your submission about uh, cutting costs, but then referred that we didn't get into the specifics there. Um, I was wondering if you had anything off the top of your head around some of those issues that we aren't discussing that you think should be cut or uh, or invested. In. I guess it's not it's not my task, and I don't know closely enough the um, you know the, the overall cost inputs we've got. I mean, the question was raised to me for every dollar that you take in rates from somebody. Um, how much of that money actually ends up coming back? How much is consumed in overhead? You know, if a rural dweller is, I mean, for example, we have a QE2 um, uh, covenant on land that we, we own, and um, we're trying to protect surrounding regenerating bush. Um, it's an expensive exercise to fence and to plant. Um, but for every dollar that I pay in rates to ECAN, how much of that is going to come back to actually enhancing that? And how much better value would we get if some of that money was left? In the community to do those activities. Thank you, Richard. Um, and I think that's drawn us to an end. Thank you for that. And I note the travel time that you've put in. And we will note the fact that you do speak to those other people. Um, I hope you've had a good experience in this room. Um, we've, we've, we've given enough time, I think, uh, for you to say what you need to say. Okay, thank you very much. So our next submitter is Ian McClellan. So welcome Ian, and you're here, I think on behalf of uh, the uh, Quail Island Ecological Restoration. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, my name's Ian McClellan, I'm as Peter said, I'm chair of the Otamahua Quail Island Ecological Restoration Trust. Um, we've been working on Otamahua, an 85 hectare island in the Little Harbour since 1998. And in that time, we've planted over 100,000 native trees and we've eradicated um, all of the mammalian pests apart from mice. And uh, the subject of my submission is that increasing problem we're having with feral deer on the island. So we've come from a situation where we were, were getting the occasional deer coming to the island to now having a unfortunately a resident population. And uh, in the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020, uh, they moved into the island in a big way. And uh, the numbers have increased and hunting by normal means is no longer effective. Uh, so we've recently um, agreed with the Department of Conservation to cost share the cost share helicopter clear control on the island. So we're going to get that underway in the next month or so. So that's our situation, but I'm uh, more concerned about the peninsula wide issue with feral deer. So unless numbers on the numbers the deer on the mainland are reduced, they're just going to keep on reinvesting uh, out Although the deer are able to trot across the mud flats on a very low tide, um, they are excellent swimmers, so they also swim to the island at other times of the day and night. Uh, I, I should have been here in 2018 and submitted to the Regional Pest Management Plan, um, but at that stage, the deer problem was not as severe. And the other issue we have is that we're very cautious about publicising the fact that we do have deer on the island as we want to avoid illegal hunting at all costs. So the deer are widespread. We've, I've heard reports of deer in Victoria Park and Bowen Bell Valley, visiting gardens and Hackthorn Road, and being hit by, hit by motorists on the Diamond Harbour to Governors Bay Road and certainly on the western side of the Port Hills uh, above Paikapu, they're, they're in high numbers. Uh, so I note that feral deer are listed as an organism of interest in the Regional Pest Management Plan, and there is a mechanism in the plan to include organisms of interest into a site-led eradicate, site-led control program at a later stage. And so the current site-led program for 
feral goats would seem to be a, an ideal template to to look at controlling the deer peninsula wide. Uh, in Northland, um, the Department of Conservation regulate deer farming up there, and the Northland Regional Council have an eradication policy for deer outside of the, those deer farms. So either of those models, so I'd like to put a case for running a similar pr program uh, to reduce the numbers of deer on the peninsula. Uh, it, I have no doubt that that is problematic because of the hunting lobby. But if we want to protect our biodiversity on the peninsula, we don't really have any, any option. And having, having such a rule in place would give us an ideal opportunity to reduce the numbers to uh, pre-1997 levels. In terms of, in terms of cost, um, I see it from ECAN's point of view as more of a rule change than a, than a big pot of money required. Uh, there's going to be a lot of investment in planting native forest on Banks Blunch in the next few years, and anyone contemplating that sort of work has to has to think, uh, has to factor in the cost of pest eradication, and deer eradication should be part of that. But a rule change would certainly help that un help get that underway. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Your point's well made. Questions. Councillor Edge. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ian, for bringing that to our attention. It's kind of um, an issue elsewhere in, in Canterbury as well. So you're, you're really wanting a, a couple of things, maybe some help with eradicating uh, deer from the island uh, is, is a key part of the money. Um, we, we, we're, we're, uh, the trust is largely supported by private businesses and we get support from Crichton City Council, uh, Littleton Port Company as well. Um, so we've got some funds to support the initial helicopter operation on the island um, and DOC have agreed to cover half of that cost. I, I guess I'm more looking at um, the policy change in terms of the regional pest management plan. I don't know if this is the forum to raise that, 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 that problem, but that would be my thoughts. But uh, Councillor Sunkel, Councillor McKenzie, and then Councillor Hands, and I think we'll call it to an end. Thank you for that. And so my, my question is you're looking for, for better control on Banks Peninsula to ensure that the problem doesn't come to you. And I'm aware that this is a conversation that we've had at other long term and annual plans off there. So, so thank you for bringing it. And that's the control on the peninsula is, is the most important part. Thank you. And my question follows on from John's, uh, Ian. Is Moipuku Peninsula, if, if, if deer were prevented from accessing that, would that stop the swimming across the Kuala? Um, one of the incentives for me um, sitting here today is the fact that in mid-March I received an email from Paula Smith in Diamond Harbour with, telling me that the, the logging of Maupuku Point was going to go ahead. So that's either going to be good or bad for us. Either it's going to force the deer uh, onto Otamahua or force them elsewhere on the peninsula. Um, but certainly that being the closest point to the island, getting them clear of getting them clear of Maupuku Point would be a great start, yes. Thank you, Ian. I'm always excited when people talk about fire security as a protection for biodiversity. Um, on that vein, there's significant additional investment in the long-term plan for biodiversity uh, functions. Uh, is it your view that we should increase further to invest more in biosecurity or that uh, some of that money could be distributed to um, more biosecurity actions rather than the, the planting and, and that kind of thing? Um, my, my point there really is um, if we don't if we don't get on the on top of the deer problem on Otamahura, we're going to stop planting. So it, it's more a case of you can't have one without the other. Um, uh, and um, 
certainly in, in, anyone looking at investing money into native planting, be it um, corporate looking at offsetting carbon, for example, they're not going to they're not, not going to sink a lot of money into doing that if at the end of 10 years all their, all their forest has been eaten away. So um, that's where I'm thinking that it's not necessarily going to be a big money thing for ECAN if, if those pots of private money are available. That might be wishful thinking. But. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. And again, uh, that as part of our deliberations, I'm sure that there'll be people talking about this. So thank you. Our next submitter is Letitia Long. And Letitia is uh, here to talk about Tiara Kakariki, Greenway Canopy Trust. So welcome to the panel. Just noting my conflict of interest being a trustee and co-chair of Tiara Kakariki. Get back. Yeah, that's noted. Thank you. Welcome, Letitia. And and like the others, Letitia, you've got 10 minutes, a ballot nine, and there's some questions. Awesome. Kia ora koutou. Um, so, um, as said, like, I'm Letitia. Um, I'm the coordinator for Te Ara Kakariki, um, and I'm making a submission on behalf of them. Um, we all know that um, native biodiversity is critical in Canterbury. Um, less than one percent of native cover. Uh, Te Ara Kakariki work with Selwyn landowners, um, ecologists, and the authorities and volunteers to restore our site to um, create a corridor of native green dots to link up the Canterbury foothills and Te Waihora, Lake Elsmere and Banks Peninsula. Um, ECAN have been great supporters of us. Um, you've assisted in, um, with funding for our Cancer Discovery Plant Out Programme and um, for our volunteer plant outs. And you've contributed to um, planting of 104 green dots within our greenway. Um, just in summary of our submission, um, we would like um, the environment Canterbury to proceed with option one, um, accelerated care initiative. Um, um, the most interesting thing of the long-term plan was the Contestable Community Fund. Um, and we're really pleased to see provisions being made for this, if the public supports it. Um, sourcing funds is an ongoing challenge for us. Um, I think if the um, contestable community fund does go ahead, we'd really like to see um, the application process um, be drawn out over 18 months. Um, we are, our, our process um, for 2022 planting in spring next year um, is starting now. We're taking applications now. Um, next month, our ecologists will review them and then we'll decide which plants to, uh, which sites to support and then we'll be putting in plant orders. So um, my experience with ECAN is that we don't find out if we get funding till after the start of the financial year in July, um, which, and then you want the um, projects to be completed within that financial year. It doesn't give us enough time to purchase the plants. Um, the nurseries are selling out. Um, last year they sold out 11, year, 11 months in advance. Um, so yeah, so, so like doing it in a 12 month um, cycle is not going to work for organisations like us. Um, uh, we'd also obviously like to see it increased and extended. Um, I think I read somewhere that it only is going to be offered for like three years. So um, we'd like it to be extended over that um, longer than that period. Um, we're also really excited to see um, increased funding for Enviro School, um, our programme um, is excellent by itself, but it's made all the more valuable um, with the support of Enviro Schools. Um, Enviro Schools allows our programme to be incorporated into the school curriculum and into the classroom. And then we're backing up what Enviro Schools is doing um, through hands-on activities at, at the Kids Discovery Centre. Um, um, and other, um, we would like to see um, um, sorry. We'd like to see a long-term grant agreement um, for Tiara Kakariki, specifically for Tiara Kakariki, um, to support the Green Dot program and the Kids Discovery Plant Out program. Um, we're 
through this we're helping sell and landowners and we're engaging like all Canterbury communities. Um, and like we have received funding through immediate seats in Whakiora, Tiniwaihora and other streams. Um, and we've also been supported in kind with plants and um, for your people, um, which, which is awesome. But um, having the, the long term funding just allows us to like plant up, plan ahead. Like I say, it's an 18 month process. Um, also, so, um, but just in terms of amount, um, I think um, like a $30,000 a year annual grant would allow us to um, support landowners with restoration planning and funds for plants for landowners. Um, it also allow us to do a couple of um, um, kids discovery plant out days with two schools and a community plant out. Um, like it's, it's fantastic to see like, um, you know, sell and landowners like the interest in planting natives is growing continuously each year. Um, but successful restoration um, for the landowners takes like a big um, investment of funding and to, to be successful, they need us to like um, share our knowledge. So it's it's really important. Otherwise, they'll be wasting their money. Um, and really, an investment in those landowners and planting projects will um, benefit all of us, like the you know in future generations, because you know the planting the, and improving biodiversity is good for all of us. So, awesome. um, that's all. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for your passion around this stuff too. And and thank you for the heads up on the logistics chain that we need to follow in terms of allowing you to do your job properly. Questions? Councillor Farm, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Clearwater and Councillor Hands. Thanks, Mr Leticia. Um, and congratulations on the work you do. Um, my question was about, like you talked about the difference between the regular grant agreement and the contestable fund. Um, and I guess just for our thinking around this, um, because you've made very pragmatic suggestions about the 18 month lead in and that kind of thing. If we were to have the 18 month lead in, would you have a preference that our contestable fund just got bigger? Or I guess for your own organisation, are you thinking that secured funding would be the most valuable for you? Or, or what's kind of the, the balance there for you? Oh, sorry, and you put your button on. Um, definitely the, um, the best outcome for us will be specific funding for Te Araka Kariki, um, long, a, a, a permanent annual agreement for a, a annual funding. Um, so you've suggested here, yeah, a long-term agreement with the Farm at Canterbury um, would be best. I guess my question is, um, if that was done, um, is there any sort of scope to expand the Green Dot program across the whole of Canterbury, or do you see this very much as just in the area that you're currently in? Um, yeah, there is definitely um, scope to expand. We have um, had interest from Waimakari District Council um, and over the past couple of years um, from through the south and north. Um, I think for us, our focus is to stick within the um, Selwyn district um, between the Rakaia and Waimaka area because it's a easy to define area and there's a lot of work to be done in that area, especially on the plains. Um, we, um, we're we we're, um, helping um, Waimaka area set up um, a similar trust to us, but I, I think um, that we would prefer to stick within our area. So there, there is scope for other organisations to replicate what we're doing and we're quite I'm happy to support them. Thank you, Leticia. Um, and you've given us some really interesting, I guess, challenges around how the right processes for a new contestable community farm. And I, I just wondered, and for us to help us in setting that up, if you think that ex, uh, if there be scope for experienced organisations like yours, and clearly for your organisation, it's really hard to find new funding. I'm just wondering if, organ if you think that organisations like yours might have, might potentially be able to assist a ECAN funding committee by way of advising. Um, definitely, yeah, we'd be, we'd be really pleased to help you out in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clearwater. Uh, Councillor Hands, and this will be the last question. 
this question is probably somewhat similar to others, but with a slightly different twist. Um, you referred to the long-term funding piece. Uh, would it be your view or the trust's view uh, that we would be better off investing in trusts like yourselves with long-term funding agreements than doing our own planting programs or, or funding our own staff to do those kind of, that kind of work? Um, well, ideally, I think ECAN would be doing the work that we're doing. Um, but I think um, investing in organisations like us, with a, um, we're, we've already proven that we can do it. We do a good job. We have high success rates. Um, we're um, kind of like bundling like the planting and re um, restoration of sites in with like their community engagement. Um, so I think you know your, your best idea is to um, support us rather than lots of little random. That's a great reply. So thank you, Atisha, for your um, for your submission and, and for your continued good work in this area. I noticed we had two councillors push back, which is a good indication that something's working. We're going to keep going. We're going to uh, Murray Cox has agreed to go early, uh, so we'll get Murray to the table. And Murray's talking about the Lake Tepapo Recreational Park. Welcome, Murray. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, allowing me to talk this morning. And um, uh, first of all, just like I did see James Page up there before, but he's disappeared. Just like to thank James and uh, his team, perhaps in reverse, but for the work that they do in Lake Tekapo and obviously around the other regional parks as well. Sorry about that class. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to get blind. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm Murray Cox. I'm, I'm presenting today on behalf of the Lake Tekapo Recreational Incorporated Society in relation to the Lake Tekapo Regional Park. Our submission basically is in support of the biodiversity and biosecurity funding under Option One, uh, which includes the regional parks. The, for those that may not know, the Lake Tekapo Re Recreational Park. Um, Corporate Society was formed in 2008 at the inception of the Lake Tekapo Regional Park and has for the last 13 years had a significant input into the development of the park through the raising of funds and providing capital assets for the park such as tracks, car parks, picnic areas, dog park, NZMCA park, pump park, a tournament dips, golf course and planting. It has also contributed a significant number of volunteer hours over the years well in excess of um, 5,000 official hours. The Society still wishes to be the principal community group that ECAN deals with in the development and management of the park, and any changes are consulted with that group. The Society has undoubtedly contributed a greater amount of capital in the establishment of the park and has invested significantly in building up its own asset base and equipment to assist the development of the park. In the booklet, deciding um, what the future of Canterbury looks like that was put out. It was disappointing that under the biodiversity and biosecurity section that the regional parks were not highlighted as they represent a unique opportunity for people to understand that regional parks have a significant role to play in becoming a model for the protection of the environment, native restoration and pest control, while providing recreational and conservation activities. There is an opportunity to educate people while enjoying the parks. The Lake Tekapo Regional Park is situated on a soil conservation area and some unique landscape and glacial features are sitting on the side of the spectacular Lake Tekapo close to the township. The park being in the Mackenzie Basin has a high profile in relation to the ongoing battle over the protection of the unique natural features in the basin. It was disappointing over the last year with the COVID-19 funding that the government was handing out that it appeared no funds were secured for the regional park, especially through the government project revitalising New Zealand communities through nature-based employment, which put up over 200 million. And there appeared to be other funds that specifically targeted biosecurity and biosecurity biodiversity as well, and it would have been beneficial for the Mackenzie and ECAN to have pest control, plantings and recreational facilities work carried out in the park. This would have also provided employment to what was one of the hardest hit areas by COVID in relation to the local economy and loss of tourism. 
and we saw this as a loss of opportunity as NCAN was party to the, to the COVID funding. One of the projects that the park could have greatly benefited from would have been a predator fence around the park, which would allow the large native planting, fauna restoration, and other conservation activities within it, allowing it for, to be a model for the area and the future. The park is a huge asset, not only to the Mackenzie, but all of Canterbury and other visitors that come to the area. It is noted that currently a ratepayer in the Mackenzie pays 95 cents a year towards the Lake Tekapo Regional Park. Under option one, the proposed new rate appears to be $10.54 per household, which we presume is a regional rate, given the opportunity for a pool of funds to be used across all regional parks in Canterbury. The Society supports this approach on the basis that presently there appears to be limited funding spent on the Tekapo Park relating to the small amount of rates funds actually collected. The society would not support the increase in rates if no additional funding was allocated to the Tekapo Park. The society looks forward to working with ECAN on the future needs of the park and developing the park with its full potential. The Mackenzie District Council is currently in the process of developing spatial plans, which will go through the district plan review, and I would expect that ECAN will submit on the spatial plans in relation to the Tekapo Park. The community has already indicated its desire to see the park develop further, and ECAN needs to be transparent in its own views about the development of the park and the forest activities going forward. The district plan review for the Mackenzie will also need to revisit the rezoning of the park, which is currently rural, ensuring any future activities can be carried out without resource consent. And this may require a change to retail zoning. District Council has also put out for consultation on its parks, trails, playground and toilet strategy for the next 10 years. This work on the strategy going forward clearly puts the Tekapo Regional Park in the position of a central hub for many of the trails and activities around Tekapo and the Mackenzie and other community groups are looking for the Regional Park to lead the way in this development. ECAN needs to be engaged in this process happening now and include provision and its long-term plan for the future growth and development of the Lake Tekapo Regional Park. The society, the society will continue to do as much as it can to protect the asset going forward and continue to develop the park in partnership with ECAN. And again, we, we do thank um, James Page and his team for the work that they have done uh, in developing working with us so far. And thank you, Murray, uh, and thank you for the amount of work that you put in also in terms of this and trying to get this right. So we've got Councillor Sunkel, Councillor Clearwater, Councillor McKenzie and Councillor Edge. Thank you, Murray. Just a question, do you sit within the boundaries of the Te Manahuna uh, area that's being developed for, for pest control and the like, or are you outside it? I'm just trying to look at the maps to see. And I guess a follow-up, is the, are you involved in the actions or, or you're just you're sitting in the area but the, you know, thank you. Thank you very much, Murray, for your presentation. Um, I just really want to ask you about your co comments, which are concerning me around um, recreational cycling. Uh, it's under your head in air, air quality transport and development. And so like, um, Public transport funding, say from ECAN, wouldn't go to those to any any um, recreational cycling. But I'm concerned, and, and that's an aside. But I'm concerned that because it'd be funded by central government or the the TA. But I'm just concerned that you see there's a, a, an implication there that there are some concerns about the current um, cycleways. And I guess you're referring particularly to the mountains to see one down the weekend. I think the comment was in relation to um, overall the environment. Canterbury obviously have a, a regional transport plan and and money put into that, um, but that doesn't really service the rural communities. So was there an op was there an opportunity in terms of the money um, in that regional transport uh, side to actually go into some cycleways and walkways for? for a regional 
to our uh, rural uh, communities. Um, thanks, Murray. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify, I suppose, uh, uh, your vision on how the forest is going to transition to a native, because at the moment it's just a pine forest, on how, how that would happen to a native forest. Yeah. Uh, I think there, there, are always, uh, there already is some work going on um, within Environment Canterbury about um, uh, around the uh, the management of the forest, the lake, uh, the regional park forest, and it will be very difficult to probably transition it to a native forest, um, but it will uh, it will be able to be done in stages. Uh, the trees with some of the existing trees would need to be uh, milled or cut down. They would need to be mulched. And, uh, and then native planters put uh, planted down with protection of some of the trees that are left and mulch that's around them. Uh, there are there is native planting going on in the uh, in the park now. Uh, Environment Canterbury do uh, do some minor native planting each year, and the society is also doing some trials on um, uh, the likes of totra and beech, uh, toas, and all those types of. Uh, Thanks, Murray. My, my question was, um, do you do you think um, that the council needs to elevate its um, strategies, if you like, for recreation and amenity development across across Canada? Um, I think it's a unique opportunity for uh, for Environment Canterbury to um, to develop those those activities and also to tell a story. I think. That's that they, you know there are prime opportunities there to um, to have the the community involved in a in a conservation project as well as providing recreational facilities. So I think that that's the that's the key for it. Okay, um, I was going to say last question, Councillor Hands, but I see Councillor Sunkle's got his hand up. So after you, Megan, and then John, and then. This one could be a quick yes or no. You've referred to borrowing here, uh, supporting only if it benefits future generations. Is it your view that investment in developing regional parks would fit into that category? In terms of, yeah, borrowing. What, in terms of borrowing? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that it's, it's intergenerational. Uh, and in terms of, if you look at the, uh, the regional park in Lake Tetapo, you would think if you're going to transition it to, to native forest and, and do proper predator, predator control and things like that, you're looking at 30 to 50 years. So I, I see no reason why it wouldn't be in the generation. Thank you, Murray, again. Um, we have a zone committee sitting in, in the upper Waitaki in the and, and, I'm, and we don't have representation of the Tika Po area. We are looking to try and set up a catchment group and bring that community into, I guess, a, a wider involvement in the conversation. Would that be useful or something your group would be interested in joining to get a, a wider profile? Uh, certainly, I think that's a, uh, that is appropriate. Uh, I used to be on the War Design Committee for our <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you, Murray. Um, and thank you for continued work in this area. I, I guess it's, a, it's developing. It's now in front of us in terms of our determination that we have to make uh, later on. I'll speak consider all the submissions as you'll be well aware um, and your other roles. So thank you. Now councillors, uh, we will resume. We will take a break now and we'll resume at um, sharply at 9.43, 10.43. Thank you councillors. Uh, we'll, we'll resume the, the hearings uh, now. We're, we're a minute early but we've got everyone in the room and I've spoken to David, David Croft and David's prepared to go earlier. Uh, we're still waiting on a couple of other people to turn up. So, David, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table and uh, you can start when you're ready. And just push the right-hand button on your microphone. Thank you very much. Kia ora, everyone. President Eisenhower once said, farming looks easy when your plough is a pencil and you're a thousand miles away from the cornfield. 
Hello, my name is David Croft and I farm with my wife and two children in the Mary Basin. I'm the seventh generation Croft to farm in Canterbury and Crofts have been on our present farm for 59 years. Of course, my father brought a dry land farm and has seen government bring irrigation to the district. We have farmed through a period of rogenomics, high interest rates and seen subsidies removed. The point being, we are not adverse to change. Irrigation has seen a massive change in our area. You will now see fewer sheep and more dairy. With that, has brought benefits and problems. As farmers, we've never shied away from the adverse effects that modern farming has brought to our area. And here is an example of this. High coliform levels that once degraded the local Pahau River, a tributary of the iconic Huanui River, caused by flood runoff that was allowed to re-enter waterways. Incidentally, the scheme was government designed and state of the art at the time. So best intention with adverse effects. Over a 10 year period, once our community became aware of the problem, we spent over a million dollars on farm, bringing the river back to its pristine state. This culminated in our district winning a Cawthron Institute Award for Most Improved River after we were nominated by ECAN. I say this because it demonstrates how ECAN and a community can work together. I don't see this collaborative approach being explored to its potential in the plan. I know we have to develop rules and laws to act as a backstop. I understand that. But I don't see where and how you are encouraging this. I know I'm being a bit simplistic, but sometimes simple is best. And to see the best outcomes and to enable change, we need to work at this, not make it harder. And often this is about having people on the ground leading. I don't see this theme coming through in the plan. In the, in, in the Chair's introduction to the consultation document, the Chair states, Environment Canterbury is required by the community and by central government to not just stop any decline in our environment, but to actively improve it for future generations. These are wise words. But I can't see in this plan how it translates into change. As it seems to me just words with adversarial outcome without leadership. For example, we currently do not have a functioning zone committee in our area. So again, I am perplexed to how much, how such a large increase can be justified from what's in the plan. So some numbers around the proposed increase. Of simplicity, I'll start with a rating amount of $1,000. So if you apply this year's average increase to the $1,000, it will take it to $1,250, give or take. And then four years of a 5% rise. And of course, this rise is compounded. After five years, a 50% increase in the rate demand from the original thousand. I see no rate reduction in five years when you will be asking $1,500 from $1,000 now. Your plan seems to incorporate your wish list items from day one. Why cannot you have a staged rollout? I urge you to reconsider the magnitude of the increase. I would think a single digit figure would be most appropriate and palatable to all in the community, especially given this is a 10 year plan. I know ECAN has invested heavily in the planning framework recently, 
and has been given no credit for this. But the reality is you still have time on your side. Yet I get a sense of panic in this plan. I would also ask you to revisit your thinking on how the UAGC is set. I thought that by definition the UAGC was used to fund expenditure for public good. So why do you think there is so little public good to be had with a low UAGC? I can only conclude that your very low UAGC value reflects your low importance of your aspirations. At a minimum, the UAGC should be at the upper end of the 30% limit. Perhaps partnerships and relationships will see our community advance, not bureaucratic castles. I can't see in your plan where you wish to develop these relationships. To me, this is a critical flaw. I'll leave you with something George Washington said. I would rather be on my farm than be the emperor of the world. Thank you for your time today, and I do not envy the task in front of you. And thank you for your great quotes. Uh, questions, Phil, uh, Clearwater. Thank you, David. Um, like I, I see that you have, um, like us, to support option two. We've really indicated that, like the di the difference um, in that, as you know, is not of, of dollars and percentage-wise, is not that great. So I'm just wondering if, following your comments, if you might be able to make some suggestions to us about what kind of areas, like whether it's under transport or biodiversity or climate change, that where we should make some cuts to achieve what you are are requesting of us. I to be honest, I don't know that much detail. But, but being a businessman, I do know that a 24% increase can start a landslide and a collapse. It don't have to be a rocket science to, to work that bit out. So. I think there's room for partnerships. Does ECAN have to pay for everything? Where, where, where are the, the, the partnerships with the business community to solve these problems? I, I don't think... You are, yeah, ECAN should be the enabler, not, not, the, the pers not the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff like to suggest some partnerships like or areas for partnership which we could um, develop. Sorry. <laughs> when, when the zone committee process, um, you know, should we get that up and up and running again um, healthily in an area of the, the wire? I don't know. Councillor Southworth. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to ask about, you, you mentioned in your um, submission about catchment groups, and I'm just wondering what what would enable you to support or help develop the catchment group in your area? What what sort of appetite is there and what would enable that to actually happen? Or perhaps there is one already and you'd like to give us a bit of information. Well, I'm drawing on my experience from past when, when we ECAN had catchment groups um, run by experienced people that knew the knew the area as well so they were able to um, advise quite directly how, how to mitigate effects or or best enable progress um, so just to clarify so environment Canterbury actually employed people who were essentially leading catchment projects yeah, yeah, that's right. Whether it be um, river, river engineers or, um, you know, the farm environment plans, ECAN had a form of them 25 years ago, um, and they worked really well because they created a relationship and a partnership. Thanks for your submission, David. Um, you've referenced us not 
having recognition for the land and water plan work that we've done. Uh, obviously, we've got the what you've called our wish list and the statutory things. What would your preference be if we were able to choose which we could spend on? Would it be the on the ground work or would it be the planning work? You need a plan um, to fulfil your regulatory stuff. But my point is, on the ground will affect change, not rules. F f farmers are extremely good because they are businessmen at finding loopholes and working around rules. You give a farmer a problem and he will go away and solve it. What is your problem? Give it to the farmer. And, and that's why I reference the Pahia River. A, there was a problem. ECAN didn't come to our community with a whole lot of abatement notices. They, they came with one of these advisory groups and they said, what are your options? Well, they gave us, sorry, they gave us our options. One, we come around with the abatement notices. Two, we'll, we'll give you a couple of weeks to go and think about this and come back to us with a plan. And that's what the community did. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I think we're just about done. And thank you for coming from the Huronui into Chum Street to give you, I know you're a bit nervous about this, but really great to see you and really great to hear what you had to say. So thank you very much. And we'll take... Uh, We'll take your um, uh, um, submission into our deliberations. Thank you. So the next person that we could call is Peter Tuffley. So come to the table, Peter, uh, from the Beckenham Neighbourhood Association. Peter, if you just push your button, us, but you've been here before, haven't you, Peter? Uh, well, thank you. Um, Councillors, for this opportunity to address you. Um, the emergence of a, a long term plan by a fully democratic ECAN is something we heartily welcome, and we broadly support the ambitious scope of the aims set out as the preferred option one. Within that overall support, we have a number of concerns, principally in three areas. The first is water and the impact of its of ECAN's of the agricultural and commercial use of water on the region's lakes and waterways and more locally on the aquifers that supply Christchurch's drinking water. The second is cooperation with Christchurch City Council, not only as regards water, but also in particular with respect to public transport and climate change. And we recognise this is an area that may well uh, come within the ambit of the impending review of local government that the government, that central government has just announced. And the third area of concern is the rating strategy set out in the L2P. Turning to water first, um, in our view, the concept of Te Mana o Te Wai requires ECAN to undertake a major shift of focus and emphasis onto putting health and quality back into the environment rather than facilitating the extraction of commercial value from it. Um, this in our view, must include rigorous and transparent monitoring and vigorous enforcement. Offenders against regulations put in place to protect the environment and public health should face the certainty of consequences serious enough to serve as a deterrent to others. A particularly vital concern to us relates to adverse impacts on Christchurch's drinking water and the aquifers on which its supply depends. These aquifers are vulnerable to pollution by seawater incursion resulting from the excess taking of water for irrigation and other purposes, like bottling. Uh, but a potentially deadly threat comes from the leaching of nitrates from agriculture 
and result resulting nitrate levels in our drinking water. And this threat needs to be addressed with the utmost urgency. People can die if this is not done. Past reports in the media have suggested sometimes that the city council's public health concerns as a supplier of, of drinking water, especially concerns about nitrate levels, have been treated dismissively by this body in deference to representations from agriculturalists. If this is so, it is, ut ut it is utterly unacceptable as far as we're concerned. This is an area in which cooperation with CCC is even more vitally important than collaboration with other territorial authorities. Another area in which we regard cooperation with the City Council as important is transport, particularly the provision of public transport services and promotion of their use. And the, the hopefully resulting reduction in exhaust gas emissions will help co combat climate change. Our, our submission, submission highlights some local instances of currently unmet needs, particularly bus routes that have been withdrawn. Less parochially, we would urge ECAN as a matter of general practice, not in future to delete bus routes without Christchurch City Council's consent. Lastly, turning to the proposed rates, we appreciate the need for a correspondingly high level of unavoidable and urgent initial expenditure. However, the impact on some ratepayers of a very steep, in percentage terms, initial rate increase concerns us. And we fear, in addition, that it could provoke a political backlash at a time when sustained public support for the success of the planet itself is, is absolutely vital. It risks giving ammunition to ECAN's enemies and to opponents of important things the Council is seeking to do in this plan, and that, in our view, is both dangerous and unnecessary. This is why we urge the Council to look for ways of, what, we, as we put it, smoothing out the rates curve and have suggested how this might be done. Um, we think there is a strong case for using the targeted rate mechanism on the grounds that it should be the polluters who pay to clean up the mess they have created, not the generality of rate payers. In conclusion, while we're generally supportive of option one as set out in the draft plan, we hope to see the concerns we have brought to you addressed. In particular, we very much hope ECAN will reconsider its approach to funding the proposed work in, in order to reduce the initial impact on ratepayers while not cutting back on work that really does need to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've got questions. Councillor Clearwater and Councillor McKenzie too. Thank you very much, Peter, for your very thoughtful submission. Um, and thank you for outlining the, the disadvantages and what the consequences of when bus routes are taken out in terms of the, of the, of the social impact on people. But I, I just wondered, like, in terms of funding to achieve, for example, a greater coverage and, and restore some of those routes, clearly that's going to take... So, sorry, yeah. It's going to take a lot of investment. I'm just wondering if you've got any, any suggestions as to how we might obtain further investment to cover that understandable but pretty big request. Are you referring, uh, um, is Councillor Clearwater referring to the, the, the reference in the long term plan to seeking alternative sources of revenue? I am, and I'm just wondering if there's any you have any suggestions around that. Um, it's not a field in which we would claim particular expertise, um, but the, the 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 city council has had that same um, goal in it in its 
in its um, annual plans and long-term plan for some time. So perhaps you could pick some brains there. So Elizabeth McKenzie. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. Um, my, oh, yeah. Um, my question is in relation to um, the air quality and vehicle emissions. Um, you mentioned in your submission that Environment Canterbury underplays the contribution to um, of, of vehicle exhaust gases versus household fires. Um, and what I was wondering is, is uh, would you then support something like more investment in monitoring of um, Traffic emissions by environment Canterbury. Peter, if you put your button on, thank you. We've already um, noted with considerable approval that, that there are electric buses appearing on the streets. We've been a bit cynical in, in, in uh, about um, ECAN's emphasis on. House, on household emissions, uh, just wondering if, if that's just because it's easier to hit a, 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 a target that isn't moving. Thank you, and my apologies for saying what I said. Um, Councillor Ian McKenzie, Councillor Grant Edge, and then we'll call it quits. Uh, thank you, Peter. I, I, I note you're uh, uh, very concerned about rural uh, water issues. Uh, are you so? Are you also concerned? The Beckenham people are also concerned about their effect on the Heathcote River. Sorry, Peter. Our neighbourhood is located within a loop of the Heathcote River, and that 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 is something that gives particular character to our neighbourhood. So that is a great concern to us. But we don't want to be parochial. Thanks, Peter. I just put some clarification. You, you're basically seeking some more, some more monitoring and greater transparency in public reporting of nitrate groundwater health data. Is that? Is it? Yes. That's great answer. Great answer, Peter. Thank you, and thank you for coming and sharing uh, the Beckenham concerns with us. They'll be part of our deliberations that we take on. So thank you. Good on you. Our next submission is by Catherine Pete uh, on behalf of One Voice Tiro Kotahi. Um, and Catherine, I see that you've got a number of people with you. If you want to bring a couple more of them to the table, you're more than welcome. If you can all fit, yes. Be good to see you. Just pull some of those other chairs up. <clears throat> Welcome, Catherine, um, and as with other submitters. There's more in the back there that can come forward if they want to. It's very intimidating watching all you people. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine, can we just, uh, yeah, Catherine, can we just go through the process with you? You've got 10 minutes, of, of course. Uh, Louise will ring a bell at nine if we get to nine, and then we'll have some questions. So, welcome. You're anything like the 10 minutes. Um, first of all, we just want to say thank you, and we also want to build on the statement that ECAN has made about wanting to measure its success by being acknowledged as a trusted partner. We think that's a really lovely way to see your role in the city. So um, our, our submission is primarily around the value that we'd like you to give to the work of our sector and that we want to focus really entirely almost on uh, achieving respect and recognition for the work that we do. And it comes in two packages, really. There's the uh, opportunity for people in the wider community to be heard. That's really important. But there's also the particularity of the work that is done and what we are choosing to call the third sector, just to make the point. Um, uh, that is organised and robust and can actually deal with deep conversations about strategy and policy. So that's the point of our submission. And we are 
much um, suggesting that the language of community partnerships as a label doesn't really help carve out that recognition. So that's what we'd, we'd like to have a co an ongoing conversation, if it's possible, about. Because this language of, of community sector somehow camouflages both the value of the input from individuals in the wider community, particularly people who are affected by a particular decision that might be going to be made. And of course, we support those voices to be heard. That's a different task from hearing the people who have a particular contribution to make to strategy and policy in that area. And that's where we feel we're not getting the recognition and respect that we deserve. And we've chosen to use funny language, if you like, like third sector, simply to make that point. So we'd really like to focus on those parts of our uh, submission that are summarised in the profiling the third sector in small, um, unbolded print, but to emphasise that this is a, a message to say we are different, here's how. We're different from the statutory sector, different from the commercial sector, and we have a particular expertise, robust and all as it is, to bring to that conversation. So I think that's really what we're asking, the reframing of the particular strategy, but that's only really just a tip of the iceberg part of the conversation. Um, and uh, we'd like to see this, these uh, conversations start well in advance of decisions. We'd like to see them being holistic, upholding the four well-beings, being treaty-based, being ecological in their approach and all of those things. And that's not new to many people around this table. So we, um, I think we can leave it from that in, in the meantime. And I'd just like us to take a moment to introduce the range of people who are engaged. This is only some of us, but we're the ones who could get here today. And so if we can just start with you, Liz, from yeah. Kia ora. Uh, my name's Liz Hawes, and I um, work for an organisation called Social Equity and Wellbeing Network. Kia ora koutou. my name is Colleen Phillip, and I'm the Chairperson of Sustainable Auto Tahi Christchurch. Kia ora, um, my name is Jules and I am both a member of Generation Zero and also working for uh, Sustainable Auto Tahi Christchurch. I'm John Beat, I'm a retired professional engineer and um, I can speak at least in part uh, on behalf of Engineers for Social Responsibility, which is a nationwide organisation. Kia ora koutou. My name is Sally Carlson and I work and volunteer in the uh, refugee and migrant sector. And is the co-author of a book that we've got to give to you. Uh, yeah. Kathleen, uh, look, thank you for that and thank you for bringing the other people to the table. So I, I need to do buttons so everyone can hear and then you can do buttons when you do your thing. Um, it's really interesting to hear this different thinking that you're bringing to the table. So I'll ask for questions, uh, Councillor Marshall. Kia ora, Chair, um, and thank you everyone for managing to find the time to come in today. Um, it's great to see a cross sector of different organisations represented. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how you'd like to see the third sector engaged with. Well, just, just um, if you could push your button for a Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, we sort of have had one little success in our story since we started this, this sort of uh, job uh, in one voice today, Kotahi. And that's with the Greater Christchurch Partnership. Um, the people that enga we engaged with there landed up uh, suggesting that we, that we form a, a relationship agreement with the Greater Christchurch Partnership, which we've done. and and. Nadja and Keith were the sort of the people who pulled that together. And um, in particular, we, we've been pleased with the submissions that came in from many people in our sector, not just one voice, Te Reo Kotahi, um, which, which landed up with a recognition in the, in the uh, collaborative partnerships section of the Our Space document, section 6.3 to be precise. And I've made a few photocopies of that available too, with a little squiggle in the right hand side to show you the, the key sentence, um, which is that uh, <clears throat> the, we have been recognised alongside 
the partner councils, the other government agencies, mana whenua, the private sector, the third sector, and the community. It's not the community. If you see what I'm saying, this is this is the key thing that we're trying to, to point out, and it's in no way wanting to undermine the value of the voices of the people who are affected by a decision. You know that, that we just don't want to ever be seen as undermining that. That's really really important. But this is a different animal. Mm. Thank you, uh, Chair Huey. Hi, yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming along. It's great to see such a wide spectrum of community. Um, voices here today. Um, I'm particularly interested um, from all of you in how we might replicate what we've been able to do with GCP here in ECAN. And I, and, and I want to know from you how best we could have that deeper conversation about that. Do you want to have it at governance level uh, with us people? Is that what you're envisioning and how might that happen? I think it initially needs to start at governance so that you get that framework named in, the, in, in a way that's not simply community partnership strategy, you know, um, uh, because those two words, I mean, as a treaty worker, you know, a lot of people are dubious about the term partnership. It implies an equal power, and it ain't true. You know? <laughs> so as one of the, one of the co-martyrs said, you know, that, that word partnership, that you've got all the power, we've got none, you know, that was in, not so much now, but in the earlier days. Yeah. Thank you. Part, I was going to ask a similar question to the other two in terms of connection, um, but since those have been answered, the other part to my question I want to ask is that we're proposing to put a contestable fund into our long-term plan, and I'm just wondering whether there's any funding, uh, uh, things that you may ap appreciate from a funding perspective, things that would support your particular sector that is perhaps not well served with contestable funds now. Sorry. An income would be nice. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, these are these are the big questions, Vicky. Um, and and this whole resourcing of our sector, uh, to me, I think to be to be clear, has to follow the understanding and the respect and the recognition of the points that we've raised. Without that initial respect and recognition, we can never get. The, uh, the, the standing back and looking at the nature of the resourcing that would better resource the work that is being done. And I'm going to call it the third sector because we need a new name so that we interrupt the, the ongoing sort of dumping of it all into this thing called the community. And also, I feel ECAN's part of the community. So is, so is local government. So is commerce. You know, people are all contributing to a, a better community. So I think it's really, really bad language. Mm. Thank you. We'll have one last question. One last question. I was just going to say about the contestable funding. Part of the issue with the third sector is the idea of competing for funding. And so um, contestable funding is fantastic, but uh, it does mean that we are all competing with each other. And that has its real problems. Good examples, though, and I mean, we can refer you to research. There was a wonderful um, Churchill Fellowship that was was, was uh, taken on, and and her work is, is brilliant on this. It, it actually talks about the possibility of people who are interested in the particular um, initiative getting together and together deciding how they would use that particular pot of gold. It may not be. It may be for a salary, or it may be for you know, fancy reproduction of something or other, or it may be, it, it, so it's just giving the sector the respect that it deserves to organise and take the steps, rather than being seen as to be prank, cheap labour to, you know, count things and mm. give data to. Can I just add as well, is that that funding that you put into the third sector is, you know, one of the only, like, you know, the funding goes back into the community. So in it is like an investment more than it is, you know, a a, a donation or, a, you know. Thank you. One last quick question of clarity from Council Clearwater. Thank you so much for coming. But my question is, besides clearly being treaty based and working that way, could you just mention briefly how, in fact, you as a group, you work with people of from other cultures? 
So one voice Tereo Kota, he has an example, is open to any organization in the third sector that would like to join. Uh, it's open to anyone who kind of shares the kopapa of a treaty-based um, group working towards a better uh, Christchurch, I guess. Um, and anybody can join that. So uh, we have, um, we well, we used to have a Tangata Fenua chair, co-chair, uh, however, he's recently resigned. Um, we also have people like myself who work in the migrant and refugee space. Um, so it's, it's really open to anyone who wants to take part in it and anyone who's welcome to join our organizing group as well. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you for bringing your group and making your introduction to us. And it's a really interesting and thoughtful subject that you put before us, and I'm sure that we'll give it the consideration it deserves when we do our deliberations. So thank you. Copies of that. Oh, and there are copies here. But any uh, of the cross sectoral connection, which is led by somebody in the third sector. And Liz, too, has been working with something called In Common, which is another one that's been cross sectoral, but that I mean government um, and other uh, and, and NGOs. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Our next presenter is Tim Frank, uh, followed by Colin Hurst and then Sean Ellis. Thank you and welcome, Tim. Uh, we're ready when you are. OK, I hope I can work the technology. So um, I really want to talk uh, about regional transport here just to, to highlight that. Um, and if it repeat some of the things that have been you know done in previous submissions for example to the regional uh, passenger, regional passenger transport plan and those sorts of things i hope uh, you can see that they're also relevant to funding now um my main concern uh with with um the, the uh long-term plan is that it's really not a transformative plan at all just from the figures that are in there it's, I think it's really great that you put transforming public transport as the aim, but it doesn't seem to be the actual result because, you know, uh, a maximum of 150 million uh, will not transform public transport in Canterbury. Um, now, I'm not sure to what extent you also expect uh, specific project funding from Maka Kotahi and how that would feature in that but otherwise i cannot see how there will be any transformative progress made in particular and i've also noted that in my submission to the public transport plan which did not make it to the summary of submissions and uh, so that's why i decided to come here today is that the transport plan still seems to chase the big white commuter in a sense it is not aimed at full life the full life experience of residents here and uh, so more and more now you in the urban centers you get more of that where you've got the uh, transport disadvantaged as they called they're being taken care of and so you've got more services there uh, but otherwise the, the commuter um, i think it you we need to look at a lot more at the potential users and actual users and from my experience i particularly speak about families which are currently not well catered for by the public transport system. I mean, we mainly use public transport, but we are five people and it costs us a lot to go by bus. It's cheaper to go by car normally. Um, also, it seems that public transport is restricted to urban transport. And I'm not sure why that is. The, the, the legislation doesn't say so. So generally, public transport should include all um, public transport. And I would encourage you to look at regional and uh, uh, interregional transport as well. Um, and I find also that I use my car most often if I want to go long distances, because you can, you know, go around Christchurch by bike and car, but I can't visit my parents in Timaru. I cannot go tramping. I cannot do anything of that. And so that has to be taken into account. I particularly want to encourage you to also think about recreation, uh, transport to recreation. Now, that makes up a big percentage of current transport. And in overseas, 
it's the main growth area of transport in itself and public transport in particular. Um, so I don't know, uh, that's just general comments. And if you see in my submission that I, that in the funding, you, I think you have to take into account the mass rapid transit in Christchurch, Canterbury Regional Rail as a whole, and um, also rail to recreation. And so if I can just go to that in particular, uh, I wanted to tell you about, you have got in the appendix rail to recreation, which I've got here. Uh, um, so that would be, uh, I think, a sign of taking that seriously. And it, it's currently, we also will always think of um, public transport as just you know, being for transport disadvantages and computers. But if we see it as interacting with other things like mental health, then we can see that uh, we have to allow people to access recreation. Um, it has been proven that uh, physical exercise, particularly in the outdoors, is beneficial for mental health, but we always compartmentalize that. So this would be part of that. So I suggest that uh, you should seek funding with Wakakotai for a project that would connect Christchurch to uh, the uh, national parks and well, the uh, Tussigland parks uh, for regular funding. Now, I note that DOC is, has already been looking at some of that. Uh, the contractors that uh, are looking at that uh, have been looking at how they can access, allow people to access this by rail, the, all these recreation opportunities. I don't think DOC has really thought about it itself in, in, in a great way. Now, of course, um, I would say that it would probably best be served with uh, totally new trains like battery electric, something like that. The question, of course, is why you you all know you've got the Transalpine running there already, but that is a high cost service. I mean, it takes, you know, five, six people are on the train. It takes uh, shunting and Arthur's Pass and everything, and everything is geared at high cost and towards high tourism dollar. I think that can be done if we've got lots of tourists, but it would be better to in include um, well, to put something there for New Zealanders that, so that they can access recreation and also allow them tourists to integrate with that, which is successfully done in lots of European countries. Uh, a bus might be suitable, some would argue, but I don't think it would get the mode shift at all. Uh, it has been shown generally that people are more likely to go by train than bus. In some cultures, that's more than others. I think New Zealand is a culture where people would flock towards the train, not so by bus. Um, the cost, well, it would be well, well be north of 100 million. <laughs> and it, generally, operationally, it would not make a profit initially, I would guess, but it would not be a huge burden on the operational cost. But of course, we don't that, know that. Um, of course, you know, in Te Huya, uh, which has start, just started between Hamilton and Auckland, it seems it was initially geared towards commuters as well, and most of the successes have been during the school holidays and weekends. So it's something that we should learn from, that we could actually aim those sorts of services towards the recreation market. If you've got more questions about that, uh, that uh, I'm happy to take those, but I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, and by your submission, you put a lot of thought into this. We've got a timetable, we've got costings, we've got all sorts of things here. So, ca ca questions from councillors? Councillor Farm? Yeah, thanks so much for your submission. And um, yeah, love the innovative thinking here. Um, my question was really about the investment. I mean, you've, you've got this, you know, quite detailed costings together for, I mean, as an overview, at least, for this idea. Um, but you talk about transformative really being in the rail space and that, that's the opportunity. Do you think, um, I mean, would you like to see, for example, your comments about the bus service? Um, would you like to see us actually diverting investment in our bus services to through the support rail if it is a budget constraint that we're trying to um, balance and prioritise? Is that what you're saying? Or is this sort of additional and you see the value in a real core bus service? 
Um, so I think we, the bus services in the urban centres are required, and they need to be well. They need to be improved, and hopefully with some mass transit in there as well. Um, well, the coverage is actually not bad for 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 Christchurch as a whole. It's just very slow. Um, so I would I would say preferably it shouldn't be diverted. It should be additional. Uh, yeah. That's Thanks very much for your submission. I was just sort of thinking, um, do you do you think that one of the issues is the um, you know for attracting people on, onto rail or bus or whatever, is that they go from A to B? The, the, the lack, is there a lack of connections from there to to other destinations to enable, enable people say to recreate um, further away from a, a main route, for example? Is that an issue? Um, currently, I think it's very difficult to get to any recreation opportunities, even in the Port Hills, because there are some, but usually bus stops are not aimed for recreation there, but, you know, to serve um, houses and, and settlements. So that's the first thing that there is nothing, not much there often that it's not a, a focus. Uh, yes, sometimes the connections are not great and are slow in particular, and, and that would help, I think. Uh, so, of course, there would have to be connections here. Uh, but as it, if, if we ingrain the culture a bit, uh, that you can, for example, if, if you catch a train, you don't have to start at the central city station, you can catch a bus there, then I think that would help all that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your submission. And as I said before, thank you for the amount of thought you put into it. Uh, it gives us some more information to consider when we go through the long term planning considerations. So, thank you, Tim. No, just about the thought. It's just an example. You know, you, <laughs> I, I don't think that will be the end result, even if we're, if we're adopted by the council. <laughs> it's good. Thank you. So, uh, next up, we've got uh, Colin Hurst. Welcome, Colin. And your button, Colin. And your, your button. That right hand side, Colin. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. Um, oh, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, it's a very brief submission, but there's some real key points I'd like to hand home. And um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, firstly, I'd like the Council to acknowledge the existing plans you've got in place, the Land and Regional Plan, and the various variations that happened in the past. You know, the council spent a significant amount on that, and I've, I've had a big involvement in that um, a few years ago. I haven't necessarily been too directly involved with regional council in, in later years, but there was a lot of effort, and I got really involved when Plan Change 3 went through um, a number of years ago. So from what I understand, it's about $60 million spent on the regional planning processes um, historically, and it seems... So my big request is to... to talk to the government and see if we can get a bit of extension on um, updating the plans. We, we need to let these plans work, work their way through. There's, as a rep, farming representative, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on on farm and I'd, I'd challenge the council to get out and see us farmers a little bit more. Um, I, 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 I'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, so to, to come and redo those plans again, I, it comes at a significant cost, so that's a, a bit of a plea there. As well, so the other little bit of a theme is how how all these things are paid for. I think um, having talked to uh, Canberra Regional Council um, in a long term plan, I, well, I did a few years ago, and um, we, we was actually fortunate that you came to Timaru to speak to us, and that was one of my um, pleads with this mission to come and speak to us in Timaru. Um, we, you know, it's a three hour drive for me to come up here. It takes me all day. Um, to come up and talk to you for 10 minutes and go home. I fortunately had a, a meeting here yesterday and some other meetings today, so it's, it's not a complete waste for me. But So a bit of a plea to, to the council to get out to the regions. And, um, you know, we've got our district council there. You can come to the Wyoming District Council and have a have a council meeting. I challenge the council to take up that opportunity to get out to the regions and come and see us. And and the, the other part was the consultation. I, I think it was very poorly handled. You didn't get out into the regions. The South Island field days, 
I was on Ferret Farmers stand, the regional councils was right next door. I think I saw four councillors, Megan, Vicky was there, John Sacknell, um, and Ian. And I uh, was there anyone else I missed. It was there for four, four days. What a great opportunity for the council to come and meet your farming, your farming um, community. So I, I'd, I'd sort of give a bit of a serve to you guys that you're not getting out. Every councillor represents every ratepayer, including us rural people. So just because you're an urban councillor, you need to get out and see us. Look, pick up the phone, give me a call if you've got any things. I've had a significant engagement with, as I said, a, a few years ago, but not recently. So one of the things I'd like to pick up, back, going back to the uniform annual charge, um, that's a people serve, a people thing. So just as an example, leadership, youth engagement, parks and recreation, biodiversity and public transport, we just heard the previous speaker, we all want public transport, but I mean, it has to be funded for a people thing, and that's where Uniform Annual Charge, I've requested you to definitely review that. It's all ratepayers for people services treated daily. Um, I've got a request in there, to, and this is a bit more of my theme about how, how things are funded. Look, I'm a, uh, on our local community catch group, the Waiho Winery one, based down in the Wami district, and uh, I'm requesting a targeted rate to, to our um, our, our catchment community groups because it's the power to the communities to, to to take up some of these challenges with the environment. Us farmers really care about the environment. We, we we're not raping and pillaging things. Apologise for the language, but we just feel like we're getting hit every day about some terrible things that a farmer's doing. We're just tired with the same thing. But when you get round to us grassroots farmers out in the out in the out, out there, um, we really care and we want to make a difference. We just need a hand to facilitate. I'm worn out um, trying to represent farmers in our capturing group. Um, it's a passion of mine and um, a lot of us want to do the right thing, but we just need a hand and we've got some really good staff in Timaru that help us and uh, um, with ECAN staff. A really big thank you. Um, ECAN, um, Kennedy Lang, Lang is one of the ones that comes to mind. I had a lot. He, he came out on the weekend and helped with one of their community planning groups just uh, a couple of weekends ago. So, four marks to him. Um, that's probably about me. Oh, just about our farm. So, our, our farm, we're a mixed cropping farm, 700 hectares. We, we have irrigation and cropping, and cropping is um, our thing. Um, and and I'll send you, might send you through my bio because a lot of you probably not don't even know who I am, but I was seeing a significant engagement with the community on both the regional and national level. Um, and just for our farm, so we're paying five, currently paying 5,683 ECAN rates and it's going to go up 28% So um, when I went through the table. So there's, there's a real challenge here. Um, I, I suggest you guys around the table here need to show some real leadership. You are the regional government. You know, I'm really disappointed that you call yourself Environment Canterbury because that, no question, the environment is important. But you are a regional government. It's that's your um, that's your core focus, and and it, and it comes back to how it's funded, I suppose. Um, so just before I finish, I, I participated in a, a global research alliance. Um, uh, 2021 virtual farmer tour, a study tour in, in relation to climate change stuff that the farmers are going on. So I just I'll send the link through to the staff, and it's a YouTube link. And and we've got four farmers from Canterbury. Um, there's David Burkett. He was he was on it. There's Eric Watson. He's at, he, so David Burkett's in the Selwyn district. Eric Watson's in the Ashburton district, and Murray Margaret Turley are based in the Timaru district. And they're all farmers, and I, I and I had the privilege to being being on that video, and um, it talks a bit about our aims and aspirations and our values, um, um, and and it, and I highlight the Lake Wainono, um the receding environment, how our farm feeds into that, and how we did some restoration on some of the waterways going on there. So, thank you. I'll just acknowledge the fact we we do um, appreciate the work you do, and you do work very very hard for uh, your community <coughs> and also nationally uh, the work that you do in terms of our section on Wellington. Uh, Elizabeth. Thanks, Colin. Um, I noticed on your submission that you do support the use of borrowing for smoothing the rates 
increase. Um, so can you give an indication of how much you'd be comfortable with, given that we don't actually borrow with the Lord anything at the moment, and over what sort of time span um, well, could be smooth? When we're making a capital investment in plans and things, I think it's important because you're borrowing for the longer term. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I can't answer that, sorry. But I, I think the core is we need to keep the rates down. And if we need to borrow to update things, that's where you'd use it for that for that type of um, activity. But it, it comes back to how we fund it. And I, I, what I've said in my submission, it, we need to have a review of the funding policy away from this process, and so it's quite clear how, how things fund it. And I know it'd be tough for some ratepayers, but um, and maybe it needs to be transitioned over time. Um, but we, we employ, you know, families on our farm. But we're a, we're an intergeneration farming family. So if my father's still actively farming, my son is farming. So we've got three generations operating on farm. That's not very common. Um, I'm sort of piggy in the middle with my son and my father at my ear, but. But anyway, look, welcome to have anybody on farm with at any time. Uh, Chair Huey. Thank you very much for coming today and making this submission. I'm very interested in your idea that we should come and have uh, councils in the rural areas. Um, if we came down to Timaru, who do you think the major groups we should um, dialogue with that day as well as have council would be from your perspective? There's a real impassion free from the a passion plea from the farmers and the community catchment groups. I think there's there's quite a push going on in the, around the Timaru Tamuka Fairy area. That's the OTOPS one, and obviously our one down in the Waimea district and the zone committee down there. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean I think this probably comes from my point of view. Obviously the farming groups, the the other community groups, no question about it. And I think you just dialogue with your your local um, councillors from that area. That's just how um, just looking at your submission, you mentioned about um, targeted rate for community catchment groups. And I'm just wondering what sort of mechanism you would envisage. Like, would it be that as a group you'd see the opportunity and then propose that your area would like to consider have a targeted rate considered, or do you think it would be more something that would be done sort of from Environment Canterbury seeking opportunities and, and groups to put in? For a rate? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably something that needs a bit of a lead in. I think obviously we'd probably start with some core funding from the council just to, to kick things off with some facilitation. I think the facilitation is a big thing. It's not a big cost, um, but I think we could do so much, maybe a per hectare charge. Or, but I think it would definitely need consultation from that, that catchment group or, or area. To, to, but I mean, I think I'm just so, sort of saying the idea. Look, I, I think we've got the rules, no question about it. There's plans coming out of areas, but you've got to get the grassroots people to, to have a willingness to do these types of things. It's um, the non-statutory stuff. You know, we can do it. We've got all the answers within the within the farming community, and um, and, and we've got to try and get a. It's a challenge for us as well. I know. So two more, Council Farm, and then Council Clearwater. Yeah, thanks for coming here today, Colin. Really appreciate the effort. Um, my question was around um, your comment in your submission that you'd like to see the land and water regional plan timelines continue. And I just was interested in your perspective because we have such a key expenditure item in renewing our regional land and water plan. Um, would you prefer that we were hands off? Because from what I hear from farmers quite often is it's actually that long term certainty which can support their investment and that kind of thing and knowing what's coming that is actually helpful. And so I mean, plans don't last forever. You'll know from the timelines that in the land and water region plan. So, would you, I mean, would you support us going out with plans that actually have that longer term time frame? And is that something that would be of use to you as a farmer? Yeah, I think so. Our plan's got a life of 10 years and it's normally reviewed after five. So, I think you just carry on doing that and it can be tweaked as it goes along. I, I, I'll be aghast if we've got to redo it all. There's a significant amount of community input. I know you. I think the quote was $60 million, but the cost of the community is huge as well. Um, it, I don't know. We had our, some of you know, but we did have a protest at the Zone Committee down in uh, Waimati six or seven years ago, whenever it was. And um, so the council threw it back to the farming group. There's a nitrogen allocation reference group, and um, 
basically gave the opportunity to the farmers that we met with council staff weekly. <laughs> you know, we the, the time and effort we put into that process was huge, and um, I wouldn't like to see that undone. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll perhaps keep you reinforce that. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, you made a comment about uh, regarding the, the whole funding thing and it being so big and so much that, in fact, we needed a review of, of like our, our funding policies. I'm just wondering if you might give us some suggestions as to how we might start there. Oh. It's always a bit difficult, this one, but it, 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 trying to determine where the benefits are. And, and as I said, those people type services, and this is the uniform we're in charge, is a really good um, a start, I think, in our Waimea district. I think, I think the council's allowed to use, it's about 30, up to 30% of their rate take with that. Um, I'm not suggesting you go that far, but at the moment, it seems very minimal, minimalistic at the 40 odd dollars. Um, I think there's scope to increase that. And we, you could probably do it at this time round. Um, but I mean, Leading on, I think it needs to be. It's it's where the benefits lie, I suppose, and and where people services are, uh, can be identified. To bring it back to the more the uniform annual charge. Thank you. We'll call this to an end, Colin. Thank you for coming uh, from Makahihi to here. Um, we do take on your points. We are some of us also wanting to get out uh, into the region. The submission weren't possible in Timaru this time, although a lot of us were wanting to do that. So. And I know how frustrating that is to you and others, so um, we will consider that. I'll just leave this document with you. It's a Bower Fair Farm Board, and as uh, I can handle it, around, you can have a look at it. Um, and I'll also drop that email the YouTube link. And I'd welcome, I'd welcome the opportunity of everybody to look at it. Good, thank you, Sean. Uh, is the next um, presenter, Sean Ellis, and then followed by Rab. And then Robin, is Robin in the room? Oh, yeah. And Robin will be the last one for lunch, so. Sure. Your button, Sean. That's the only thing you have to remember is your button. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me along. Uh, I'm here to talk about what nobody else wants to talk about. Um, everybody thinks I'm some kind of mad guy, but I'm not. Please listen to what I've got to say. Um, just a little bit about myself, Sean Ellis. Uh, my background is I did um, 24 years in the British Army. Came over here, worked for TB3 New Zealand, and then I moved uh, back to a, a Shepparton in the high country. While I was up there in the high country, I used to hunt a block that became dead absolutely dead of all wildlife. So I decided to um, do something about it. So I went down to the local information centre, the pub, and said, uh, right, what are we going to do, boys? And the pub turned around and said, whatever you do, don't tell anyone, because they'll tell an idiot. The only way to get rid of all the pests is to trap them. So a couple of hours passed, and I got a bit drunk and said, I'm going to do it. And five years later on, I've got a beautiful bit of bush, bush block. Uh, I've got over 250 traps up there, and I checked them out um, three times a month. It's all off my own back. I've got a lot of good press doing it. And the council came along and had a look at Southern Council. And when this is brilliant, Predator Free New Zealand's a big thing, and we'd really like you to turn Springfield, my little <laughs> patch of New Zealand, my home and town, into a Predator Free township. And I basically turned around and said, no, I can't do that. We've got too many cats in the township. And I can't distinguish between a feral cat and a domestic cat. So how do I how do I distinguish amongst how do I get rid of all the feral cats and not harm the domestic cats? So that plan died a death because I wasn't going to do anything about it. But again, I went back to the information centre and they, you know, bought me a beer and said, kick me up the bum and said, come on, get on with it and don't lie down. So I started to lobby the local council, selling council. And I went and spoke in front of the council with the backing of DOC. I got letters from DOC, Forest and Bird, SPCA, all of our local farmers, the Y Makiriri um, Trust, Arthur's Past Trust. I went through, I went to every township meeting 
and asked them if they would back it. They all thought it was a great idea. I then went to the community board and asked them if they would back it, and they thought that was a great idea. And then I went back to the council with a proposal. The proposal was that they change their um, uh, domestic animal bylaw to include feral cats as a pest and to make domestic cats or loved creatures that we all look after a distinguishing mark between them. Domestic cats will be microchipped. So that brings me here today and everyone around this table here can agree that everyone's got a cat story. Everybody has got a cat story, whether it's a great one, a bad one, whatever. Um, but the cat, the feral cat, is the apex predator in this country. It is the number one killing machine that we've got. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think that Doc are out there killing them in the thousands. The Isaac Trust, which is just up the road from here, is the biggest bird native bird program in New Zealand. And they kill up to 300 cats a year. They're probably doing it illegally because they're not checking them for microchips. But what is the right way and wrong way? What's the distance from the township? What is a feral cat? What is a domestic cat? Nobody wants to put their head above the parapet and talk about it except for stupid old little me. Public opinion has actually changed. It's changed in that we've got so many cats now, we don't know what to do with them. The SPCA has changed its policy. SPCA is saying it's, it's great having a cat, but keep it indoors if you can. Have it microchipped, have it neutered. SPCA don't take in cats. You'll see on the TV, they take in kittens. So where are all the cats? They won't take them in unless they're injured or they're threatened with death, probably around my house. So the SPCA have changed their whole view. They were the people that used to take them in. The Companions League have got their own cat pound here, just outside, just outside town, Wilston, and they're thinking of setting up a second one because the need is so great in this area. The cat ladies in the area, who are strange, but if, if you're going to fight an argument, you need to fight both sides of the argument. The cat ladies never wanted to be cat ladies. They just didn't want to see cats killed. So once you take in a cat, the neighbour down the road knows you've taken a cat, they'll drop off another cat, and they drop off another cat, and they drop off another cat. So these cat ladies who live in the black web, trust me, there's a lot of them, and they've got a little network going on and they all know who's who oh, some of them have got up to 50 cats i know one lady who's left her house and lives in a caravan and her house is now where she keeps all the cats and that ain't healthy but she's so desperate that there's no way to take them where do you take a cat whether it's a domestic cat or a feral cat where do you take it nobody wants to know no one wants to make a decision no one wants to do anything about it except hide their head. But we all want to be predator free by 2050. Yeah, right. So what do we do about it then? So basically I've been to Selwyn District Council and they're umming and ahhing and it goes to the last debate. It's been on the bylaw, off the bylaw, on the bylaw. It's just, it's trying to make a decision is pretty hard. So I thought, well, why not go to the organ grinders? That's use law. Somebody who can make a bloody decision and who are our local government. You are the leading force in this area. The other councils look to you to make decisions. And that's where we're at. If I can get you on board, the other councils have fallen into place. They're just looking for leadership. And the leadership has got to come from government. It's a case of who blinks first, really, isn't it? Councils really want to do something about it, but they're not sure what ECAN would say, and ECAN don't really want to do anything about it because all the councils and the lobby groups and the cat ladies, and this is to make a distinction between a cat we love and a feral cat. And there's not many cats out there that we love that aren't already microchipped and neutered. And the costing, so what kind of costing would this do? Well, it actually, it's a self, it, it works by itself. You're not going around the country making sure that every cat's microchipped. 
you're just saying that if your cat isn't microchipped and it's caught, it's deemed as a feral cat. And there's a lot of people out there catching cats. The area that I was talking to you about, my 100 hectares, when I cleaned it out initially, we got 14 cats over 100 hectares. Now I get twice, two, maybe three a year. That brings me on to my proposal. And the proposal is to make a complete distinction between what we love and what we look after, what we care for, and what we want to have as part of our family. And some scraggy thing that keeps coming around doing stuff in our veggie patch, howling at night, and we can't do anything about. To make this distinction, my proposal is that all feral cats will be distinguished by not having a microchip and that all trapping within one kilometer of a township or a, a city, that's the perimeter of that, has to be done on a live capture. A live capture trap can then identify the cat. If it's got a microchip, it can then be taken to the SPCA. If it's a long way from home, the SPCA will then um, try and prosecute for abandonment. So again, it's not up to ECAN to come up with some solution of what we do with all these cats. We get a lot of abandoned cats up at Springfield and they're all along there. So we have a trapping area of a radius, I'm just saying a kilometre outside the townships, live capture. You can check the cat in the trap. If it's got a microchip, you've then got a means of getting it back to its owner. If it hasn't got a microchip, well, there it goes on a big long journey. I'd just like to finish by saying, if you don't think cats are a problem, you don't think stoats are a problem. You don't think rats are a problem. You don't think um, ferrets and weasels are a problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, being so forthright in terms of the, the story of the cat. Now we've got Councillor Huey, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, John. Uh, I know this. A, thank you very much for coming along today on, on, and putting this proposal forward. Um, I know there's a lot of research, recent research showing to, to back you up, especially around studies around bird, ground nesting birds and low tree net birds, and that feral cats are a huge problem. Uh, on Banks Flinch, they're um, using some pretty high new technology around cats. Um, uh, do you know what's the best trapping method for cats? And um, have you tried any of the most recent technological advances in that area? Yeah, so cats, uh, the thing you've got with cats are the natural hunters. So you let them out of the house and they're going to go and naturally hunt. So if you're trapping around a township, you can't have a kill trap. You've got to have a live capture trap. So there are some fantastic uh, traps out there, but they're not intended for townships. That's, that's the main problem. So we've got to live capture the cat so that the cat lovers, and I'm honest, I love cats, they're just not meant to be here. The cat lovers can see that something's being done to protect their cat. It's not just going out killing them. Out in the out of the sticks, they're shot on sight. And, you, and I can imagine there's some farmers here that would shoot cats on sight because we've got a massive problem with toxoplasmosis. It costs uh, $2 a jab for your sheep. So your new sheep coming into the area, every sheep needs to be jabbed with toxo. That's massive in this area. We also got toxoplasmosis running into our rivers and, and streams. And it's been found that the hectares dolphins that were, um, that were autopsied had toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis can't be um, screened out through the sewage system that we've got in New Zealand. So when you clean out your kitty train, then throw that down the toilet, toxoplasmosis seeps into the water system and then goes out to sea and kills mammals in the sea. So the, the traps out there are fantastic, but they're not meant for the township. And the only way you can catch a cat in the township properly is to live capture it and check it for a microchip. So, so to a degree, um, Sean, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you already answered my question, and that was going to be what, uh, what proportion of cats are shot and what proportion are caught. 
so, so your solution is primarily around semi-urban and urban cats rather than feral uh, feral cats in the, in the wild. Um, I wondered whether perhaps an ear tagging process might be more effective so you could identify them from a distance. So, so the, the ear tagging or the ear clipping as, um, yeah, yeah. Well, what they usually do is they, when they capture a cat is they take a, a, a clip out the top of the cat's ear and that can tell you that it's been uh, microchipped and neutered at sight. Uh, not a lot, a lot of people use it, but they're mainly the cat ladies, believe it or not. Cat ladies do that for their for their broods of cats. Um, the, it, the problem in the rural is coming from the urban. So unless we tackle the urban situation, we can never tackle what's happening out there. The, the Wymac River bed all the way along, it's got all the fishing areas all the way along there. You see the little fishing rod there, you come and launch a boat here. You talk to the farmers down there to say, if your car goes down, it's down five minutes and comes back, he's got to knock over some cats down. And that's a problem we've got. No, thank you for this. This is um, pretty interesting for us and, and a great challenge, I guess, in terms of our deliberation. Uh, and I think you've got everyone's attention around the table. Uh, and I think you've, you've probably had a few spots that we need to consider pretty seriously. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Can I grab a coffee before I go? Awesome. Unfortunately, we only got coffee. A week. <laughs> and tea, and tea apparently. But, uh, <laughs> good on you, good on you. Keep up the good work. Uh, so Rev, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table uh, and then uh, we've got Robin after Rev. Yeah, I'm Rev McDowell, and uh, I see that you say that you read my written comments. I have pity on you because I wrote those online, um, I think Sunday night before the deadline, and after reading them back later, I found there's a whole heap of typos and spelling mistakes and things. It's probably make it hard to understand. But a bit of background note myself. I'm a farmer from Mayfield and Canterbury, farming 360 hectares. Uh, it's a diverse farm. I finish lambs. I uh, raise uh, young dairy stock for a contract for a dairy farmer. But the most important part of our farm is uh, growing crops. We grow wheat, barley, grass seed, pak choy, hybrid carrots, chrysanthemum, radish, hemp, all those guys will come by an harvester. And probably worthwhile just commenting on the fact, that fact and that um, it's, I guess generally considered that uh, one of the biggest environmental issues in terms of farming in Canterbury is uh, dairy farming. As you can see, we're not a dairy farmer. But... Um, and we're growing the kind of crops that many people who think dairy farming should be moving into. But I'll just make three points about the, the feasibility of that. And that is um, the gross income of our farm is around five and a half thousand dollars a hectare. It's half the gross income of the dairy farm next door. So there's a real problem in trying to find alternative dairy farming profitability. Most of the seed crops we grow have limited markets. For instance, uh, Canterbury grows roughly, I think, about a third of the hybrid carrot seed for the world. Just growing more hybrid carrot seed doesn't mean that the, car the world's going to need more carrot seed because it's not going to eat more carrots. So the opportunities for diversification like that are not as great as they may seem. And the third comment I'd make is uh, if you think that uh, dairy farming has got environmental issues, it's not alone in that. And coming back to our hybrid carrot crop, we have to spray that crop somewhere between 17 and 20 times between planting and harvest. Uh, so there's environmental issues in those kind of crops also. So there are severe trade-offs, I guess, in trying to work out just where the best way forward is for sustainable farming in Canterbury and how we handle those environmental issues. Um, as well as farming, I've had the fair degree of involvement in environmental issues around uh, McCanterbury, I was um, involved in the, um, oh, when the Zone Committee went through the process in McCanterbury for the lead to plane change too, I chaired the group of farmers that was providing feedback to that and making that plan um, more workable while still achieving the aims of the city up to itself. About three years ago, when uh, ECAN was first looking at um, how to audit farm environment 
plans. Uh, one day I had nine ECAN staff around our table um, on a trial ECAN audit, uh, training auditors on how to do audits. So, so my involvement in that process has also been quite extensive. I'm a trustee of the Hinko Hines Water and Huntman Trust, which is looking at aquifer recharge, and uh, we'll get involved in that. And also, for the last six years, the, last, the second year degree students at Lincoln University have come to our farm for a field trip because our farm is more diverse than most around. But so I've had quite a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> coming to the, the, the long-term plan, I noticed in the introduction that um, you say that New uh, Canterbury is the largest region in New Zealand with 4.5 million hectares. So. But it also goes on to show that 82% of the population lives in what they, it was called Greater Christchurch, which I think is an area that basically you're from Rangiora to Burnham to Littleton and everything in between. But that's only 3% of the area. And it's worth keeping that in mind as a council because um, the, if 82% of the population are growing at three, uh, live in 3% of the area, there's another 97% out there that are doing their best to make their way through. And the representation on a population basis, so uh, you really need to be aware of just how the rest of the region is working and um, what they're doing to... Uh, to address the kind of issues that you want them to address. The other issue that came through in the introduction was that um, the economy is, uh, the economy is about 37 billion, but farming doesn't rate anywhere in the top three, according to your summary. I find that interesting given that dairy farming, uh, which um, takes up only 10% of the arable and pastoral land in Canterbury, uh, that's about 270,000 hectares, its farm gate milk price is worth um, somewhere around um, two and a half to two point six billion dollars, which in itself is uh, close to seven percent of the uh, gross domestic product from the area. And that's only ten percent of the farming area. The other ten percent will probably be producing another equally uh, seven billion dollars, I guess. Which means that uh, on that basis, uh, agriculture, rather than being six point six percent of the economy, as you put in your intro in your plan process um, would be near 15%. Uh, ongoing, you did acknowledge that manufacturing was the largest contributor to um, to uh, the regional post domestic product. But then later on you say that uh, menu, primary manufacturing, in other words, manufacturing of primary products was um, about 60% of that manufacturing. So overall, the farming area isn't getting the recognition in your statement that uh, I think it uh, should have had. So coming back to your plan under funding, uh, I guess in general I'm in, uh, uh, in favour of the, those who benefit uh, from the process should pay. And uh, for that reason, um, we're looking at targeted rates, particularly also for the active recharge project. But keeping that in mind, um, there are many programs that benefit all the uh, ratepayers, and uh, Colin Hurst was also mentioning these. Um, they are more equitably funded through a universal annual general charge. And um, when, as I said earlier, 82% of the population of the 3% of the area, the general rate, putting pro uh, programs on a general rate, which could otherwise be funded by a, a uniform charge, spreading the funding base uh, of 100% of, of the area back into 3% of the population uh, population area. Uh, so there are grounds for um, a greater degree of funding from the, from the University of Charge, which I think the Council should pick up. The, uh, the key area and the key area in terms of containing costs, and you're proposing uh, an option of 24.5% increase in rates, but that's a bit of a misnomer in some ways, and that uh, comes down to whereabouts you are and what kind of area you're looking at. Um, when I go to the rates calculator on the ECAN website, our rates this coming year are due to rise by 92%, not 24.5%. I am uncertain as to whether that includes the um, Target rate we're looking for for the uh, recharge project in the highest plains, but I do note that in your um, 
consultation document, you state that um, a targeted rate for the local action community for active recharge would be required. And this is not included in the, in the figures for option one and option two. So over and above an increase of 92% uh, under option one, we're also looking at uh, putting on a targeted rate for active recharge. So I guess all that comes down to um, um, affordability. Yeah. And um, in my submission, I said that the rates increase that you're looking at are not affordable. And um, forgive me away, when you look at, in our case, we're looking at an increase in rates from ECAN of, from around $5,000 up to about $9,500, $4,500 increase, even though the uh, quoted rates increases for farmers in our area and the paper by the council have suggested it would be seven or $800. On top of that, we're looking for, uh, we're doing a great deal of work in terms of an extra cost in our farming operation in terms of preparing farm environment plans. Uh, and in our case, because it's a diverse and complex farm, it costs about $5,000 a pop for a farm environment plan to be prepared. But we're also looking at um, on-farm mitigation as part of plan for change two, we're required to reduce our nitrate leaching by 36 percent in the next 15 years and that's going to require not just cost and implementing but also perhaps cost in terms of reduced production in areas and then as i say on top of that um, we're also proposing and we've had uh, good support for a targeted rate for the actual recharge to try and also address those areas uh, the, the leaching process the legacy issues that um, have been carried on from the past so a rates rise in itself may not look like it's unaffordable, but when you start putting in place all the other costs that are being imposed on farmers in our area, it's getting close to being unaffordable. And the council really needs to take um, take a look at that. And the other um, comments I'd like to make around the process is, um, yeah, um, in terms of controlling costs, as I said, I was involved in the plan change two process. It was um, a cost exercise, uh, not just in terms of funds, but also in terms of effort from local community. We we need the um, regional council to uh, kick back to the government and say, "Hey, look, we've done the work already. There's no need to redo these plans. We can pick up on a fair bit of that work now." And it, I don't know how much the council has done that area, but it needs. He's pretty strong on that. Um, the HH Wet Trust has gone to Parker and says, hey, look, these are the issues we're facing. This is where you've got to work through it. I should very much hope that he can have been doing the same. Uh, in terms of fees and charges, uh, I note, as well as the other increases that are coming on farmers, there's a substantial increase in fees for um, consents and those type of things. Uh, and you may say they're unavoidable, but given that the council is in a monopoly position and its funding uh, is set by itself. My view is that as many of those tasks need to be contestable as possible so they can be done outside um, the council and therefore bring in some competition. Yeah, at that stage, uh, Rab, when uh, you've probably got a half minute left, if you want it. All right, so questions from councillors. Councillor Southworth. Yeah, thank you for your submission there. Um, I'm interested in your suggestion of using the UAGC to fund public transport. Um, I'm just wondering, so that the UAGC would spread the costs across all of the ratepayers of Canterbury equally, or do you think we should be funding through targeted rate? Uh, this is going for itself, is <laughs> yeah, I only to <laughs> Okay, I see. Okay, um, yeah, uh, as I said, I did it late at night, and then uh, I was looking for examples of where the universal uh, general charge could be uh, expanded to, but uh, uh, transport funding uh, should be a targeted rate, uh, not just for Christchurch, but I see, the, for instance, the, the, um, the program in Timaru. Uh, there's a question in the survey that you sent out as to what our view was on that. My view is, hey, look, that's for Timur to decide because if they benefit and if they wish to continue it, uh, I've got, I'm quite happy for them to have a targeted rate for that. Thank you. Question. 
Thanks, Rex. Nice to have you here, and it's nice to have a grade farmers here too. Uh, just you referred to all of the different costs that are, that are mounting up. Um, what are rates increase uh, impinge on your, your ability to spend on some of those other things that you need to do as, as a result of plan change too? There's, there's no free lunch. Uh, if and if we have extra cost in one area and we're looking at running a proper business, we're going to cut costs somewhere else. Uh, it may not be in some of those other areas you speak of, but it could well be uh, in the local community. In terms of uh, if we're paying more rates, we've got less for other uh, spending in other areas. So, uh, yeah, paying extra rate takes it from somewhere else. Yeah. Thank you, Rat Time, but we can do one more question if there's one. If not, Rat, uh, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, and putting the thought that you have, even though it was late at night, into your submission. Um, it was good to see you here. Thank you. Robin. So now we have Robin Barraclough. I don't know, Robin, if you understood the bell, but the bell's at nine minutes. It gives you another minute. So, yeah, when you're ready. Um, so good afternoon and kia ora, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Robin Barraclough. I work as a locum GP and rural hospital doctor here in New Zealand. I'm a New Zealand citizen and I happen to call Christchurch home. Uh, I'm not an expert in epidemiology, nor am I an expert in public health. Nevertheless, through my work in uh, rural New Zealand, I've helped to diagnose many patients with colorectal cancer. I've also been involved in the palliative care of patients who are at the end of their life due to metastatic colorectal cancer. I believe there are a number of issues within the Canterbury environment uh, that currently impact on human health. And today I'm just going to focus on one of the issues, specifically nitrates in drinking water. Uh, this issue is foremost in the minds of many Cantabrians and myself, other than uh, being associated with the Royal New Zealand College of General Practice and the New Zealand Alpine Club. I've got no other attachments or affiliations, hence the views I'm offering today on my own. Um, after a lot of thought about what to say, I thought the simplest thing I could do is to walk you through the kind of consultation that happens in a GP practice every week all over Canterbury. Let's say that the patient I'm seeing is male, he's in his mid-50s. I glance at his electronic record before inviting him in, and I know that his body mass index, he's not obese. Neither is he diabetic, he's not a smoker, he drinks within normal limits. And also I know that he's Maori and he's a local dairy farmer. I pop my head into the waiting room and invite him in. And as he comes into the room and sits down, I sense that he's a little anxious. We exchange some pleasantries about what the weather's been doing recently. And he then informs me that the reason he's come to see me today is because he's noticed some blood on the toilet paper when he went for a poo recently. So I ask a bit more about the bleeding, which is my job. The blood is often dark, it's clotted, and it's often mixed in with the poo, and it's actually been going on for weeks. I then ask about the man's bowel habit, and it turns out that this changed sometime before Christmas. Instead of once every other day, he's now looser and goes every two to three times a day. And while he denies having any abdominal pain, he actually confides to me that he thinks he's lost a few kilos since Waitangi Day. I checked to find out if there's a family history of bowel cancer, and there isn't. Neither has he ever had hemorrhoids or any other kind of bowel problems in the past. I tell him that to get the whole picture, I'll need to do a brief examination, and this will include having a feel of his tummy and also popping a finger into his bottom, a DRE, or digital rectal examination. 15 to 20% of all colorectal cancers are found just inside the rectum. Understandably, he's nervous. You reassure him that you've done this uh, dozens of times before and it's uncomfortable rather than painful and that while I'm there I'll check the prostate too. He consents to be examined so I press on different parts of his tummy which is soft and pain free. However, I think I can definitely feel a lump in the lower left quadrant of his abdomen. The DRE examination finds nothing but a normal size and shaped prostate. Armed with all this information, I have to work quickly in the time left. I'll tell him that his story is concerning. 
I'll also acknowledge how hard it must have been for him to come in to see me today. He then asked me straight, what do you think's going on, Doc? Treading a fine line, I tell him that the signs and symptoms that he's got can be caused by bowel cancer, and that while I'm not entirely sure what the exact cause is here, I think we should do some stuff to rule out that sinister cause. I can see the anxiety lined in his face, and I tell him that I'm going to ask him to come back in a few days to check in, because there's a lot going on here from today's meeting uh, to process, and I think it's good that I'll catch up with him again later. I suggest that for completeness, we should do some blood tests to look for anemia, liver, kidney problems, as well as a uh, rule out any problems with iron levels. And because he's a farmer, I'll also ask him to collect a poo sample to rule out things like parasites as well. Wrapping up the consultation, I also tell him that because of his age, unexplained bleeding, and a new change to his bowel habit, that you're going to urgently refer him through to the local surgical unit, as well as requesting an urgent CT scan of his bowel. As he's leaving the room, he lingers in the doorway and he asks, Doc, do you think that this has happened because of, you know, the nitrate thing? These kinds of consultations are difficult at the best of times, but if I, it had ended like that, uh, I would have probably felt extremely uncomfortable. Uh, and rightly so, because as things stand, I can't honestly deny to that man the possibility that the concentration of nitrates in his particular drink of water supply isn't a factor for him. New Zealand has got one of the highest rates of bowel cancer in the developed world. The rates are significant uh, throughout the geography of New Zealand. So South Canterbury, Southern New Zealand, Taranaki, the Nelson Marble regions are the ones with the highest rates of bowel cancer. And it's also known that these regions have some of the highest levels of nitrate in their drinking water. The association between nitrate concentration in drinking water and the development of recolorectal cancer is known and is becoming nuanced as the science is developing. And in terms of a modifiable risk factor for colorectal cancer in New Zealand, heavy drinking and uh, obesity are probably the, the two greatest risk factors. But underneath them, it's evident that elevated levels of nitrate are also likely to carry a similar risk to established risk factors like the consumption of red meat, consumption of processed meats, lack of physical activity, and smoking. Unlike the foods that we eat, most individuals in New Zealand have no control of the amount of nitrates in their water, drinking water. They often rely on local authorities to make sure that their water is healthy and clean. Sadly, New Zealand has a poor track record when it comes to water. Many beaches are too polluted to safely swim at. The same can be said for many of our rivers and lakes. With disturbing frequency, water supplies continue to be affected by bacterial contamination and for example, down in Otago from heavy metal pollution. To be clear, I've, I've no issue with farmers or dairy. Many farmers are often just trying to make a living and they're driven by the demands of the market to farm in a certain way. Uh, but as a clinician, I have a moral and ethical obligation to raise issues regarding people's health. I believe Kiwis uh, have a right to safe water, not only for drinking, but also swimming and recreation. I also believe that at the centre of this issue regarding nitrates in our water supply appears to be a disconnect between in the social contract between many of our statutory organisations and the health of the people that they're meant to look after. Lack of transparency and hesitation in cleaning up our water is causing upset in the public mind and it's hard to justify to those suffering from possible waterborne illnesses. For me, the issue begs the question, What's more important, the dollar value of the human or the human value of the dollar? Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for that. It was no, no, sure. that was great. Hey, thank you for that. There's a very graphic illustration, I guess, on terms of your daily, uh, your daily grind. And, and thank you also at the start of that to say that this was your personal, uh, personal submission. Uh, but it, it raises uh, a, a few interesting issues. Uh, so we have got Councillor uh, Elizabeth McKenzie and uh, Councillor Megan Hands. Um, thanks. I noticed in your submission um, you've made the statement that um, Environment Canterbury will bear some responsibility if a patient can demonstrate that their health condition has been directly influenced by our policies on air quality. And I, and I presume you're referring to the um, PM 2.5 um, from vehicles and that type of thing. Um, so 
do you think we should be investing more staff or time or monitoring in that area? Um, can you give us your thoughts on that? I think this issue has been uh, demonstrated already in other parts of the world. I'm thinking, for, ex for example, in the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom government has actually been uh, found liable um, in, a, in one of the highest courts of law uh, for not keeping um, air pollution levels uh, to stated norms. Uh, and I think if you're um, uh, mindful uh, of uh, your statutory uh, responsibilities, then you, you might need to be aware of various pollutants within the environment here in Canterbury, in, not including uh, air, air pollution limits, but equally nitrates uh, as well. At the moment, we know there's an association, uh, but if that goes on to be proved to become a causation, then the limits you've set may well um, be influential in that. Um, so I'd be quite mindful of some of those, those issues. Um, but um, it's not for me to tell you to uh, to do your job. <laughs> I don't think. Thank you, Councillor Haynes. Thanks, Dr. Ackler. Um, just obviously, we're aware that there's three water reforms going on and all of that sort of thing. Um, I just wondered, um, given the time lag of nitrates moving through in government reforms, um, I mean, we can talk about source water, which is our you know, core responsibility. But given that time lag, would it be your clinical view that filtration or treatment should be supported for those water supplies that may be at risk of high nitrates? I mean, yes, I think you should be proactive. Um, um, you, you know, you'd have to be mindful of course, because some filtration um, doesn't actually remove the nitrate, as you may well know. Uh, but yeah, I, I think a lot of the evidence is moving very rapidly and it's, it's moving in one direction at the moment. Um, so why not be proactive and get ahead of it? And moreover, I'd say that actually, if in a more positive light, if some farmers actually wanted to start selling milk at a premium um, that they could demonstrate was done in a more sustainable way, I, for one, would happily pay for that. Thank you. So two more questions, Councillor Clearwater and then Councillor Edge. Thank you very much for your presentation, Robin, uh, especially for blokes. Um, as we know, there have been a lot of studies done besides the one in Denmark. You'll be aware that um, the study was done in Italy and in Spain in 2016, which actually showed some similar links. Um, and at the time, though, our government said, no, we, we need a lot more. Um, we need a lot more investigations. I had understood that, in fact, the Ministry of Health were speeding up the research and recently had a lecture from Dr Anderson from Dunedin. And, but his were really about his own study. So I'm just wondering if you know where the um, Ministry of Health uh, follow-up research is at at this stage. My understanding is that the, uh, the lead re researcher from the Denmark study is now uh, involved in supervising uh, a much wider study here through Otago uh, here in New Zealand. And so they're aiming to replicate uh, or, or rather uh, follow the same guidelines to, to make that happen. And it's actually in progress right now, I believe. But I, I have no association with that at all. Just quickly, in terms of the scenario that you were painting a picture of, do you, in a situation like that, um, ask for water samples uh, from the person's drinking water, or is that something you know, you know that the health department's responsible? I mean, in a in a day to day, a busy general practice, I just don't have the time for. Kind of things, um, uh, but I, I think that um, yeah, that's that's increasingly kind of in our minds. But I'm I'm not sure where as a doctor I, I go with that. Um, I'd probably if I was really worried, I, I guess I'd go to the public health uh, team and flag it to them. Look, thank you, Robin, uh, for that very insightful look into your daily practice or your daily grind and, and and we will take that under consideration so thank you for your submission now councillors we will return promptly be seated at one thank you